at that and say good morning and welcome to the uh, July 21st, uh, 2023 Senate Transportation Committee meeting. I'll start uh, by calling the meeting to order. And before we go, uh, go any further, I would like to ask our interpreter how to access the interpretation. Uh, Alejandra, can you go ahead and give us our instructions? Hola, ¿qué tal? Muy buenas tardes a todos. Este es un aviso por parte del intérprete para hacer uso del servicio de interpretación. Favor de desplazarse a la parte inferior de la pantalla de Zoom donde aparecen los controles. Haga clic en el icono de interpretación que es el globo terráqueo y seleccione Spanish o Español. Si está utilizando la aplicación móvil de Zoom, celular, tableta, etc., presione los puntos suspensivos, los tres puntos, y luego Interpretación, y luego seleccione el idioma. Si no desea escuchar el audio original en inglés que se escucha en el fondo, por favor seleccione Mute Original Audio, que es Silenciar Audio Original, y nosotros contamos con auriculares disponibles para el servicio de interpretación. Si se encuentra en la sala de reunión, favor de pedir auriculares con la recepcionista del vestíbulo. Thank you, Marie. Um, I'd like to ask our uh, clerk, Francesca uh, Webb, to confirm that we have a quorum and, and call for attendance, roll call for attendance. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> uh, North County Inland is absent for South County, Councilmember Duncan. Present, thank you. For the City of San Diego, Vice Chair Campillo. Here. For the County of San Diego, Supervisor Anderson. Here. For East County, uh, Chair Shu. Here. And Council Member Mendoza. Here. For North County Coastal, Mayor Kranz. Here. And Deputy Mayor Zito. Here. For Metropolitan Transit System, Council Member Moreno. Present. For North County Transit District, uh, NCTD Chair Jewel or Edson. <laughs> Present. And for Port of San Diego, Chairman Castellanos. Is the, I believe the port may be absent. Sorry. Yes. And that completes the roll call. We do have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. The airport authority is present. Yeah. Well, we'll go ahead and have uh, general public comment uh, now so for these items not on the agenda. Um, and because I anticipate some uh, longer discussions later in uh, today's committee meeting, I'm going to go for two minutes for a public comment. So, Francesca, do we have any members of the public who want to make uh, a general comment? I guess we do have three public comments on this item. Uh, the first in person will be Dr. Bailish, and then we will go to Catherine Rhodes on Zoom. Good morning, Transportation Committee. My name is Dr. Tim Bailish. I speak quite a bit, probably too much. Thank you for this honor. And I want to honor the people who make uh, commitments to public service and to our well-being. This morning, I sent an email to the clerk. I hope you would get a chance to take a look at it. Um, I've talked for two years about particle matter because a, a person I happened to meet by chance started to talk about it. And uh, so I pulled an article about three weeks ago, I think, showing that there's evidence when the particle matter from the tires on the cars that we drive gets up into the atmosphere and we breathe it in, that the combination of that with women who have a vitamin B12 deficiency, which is an area I know quite a bit about, they triple their risk of gestational diabetes. We have not been looking at the health effects of our driving. And we're pretending that by only doing what other people say at the governmental level is enough, is enough. And I'm sorry to say, as a scientist and a physician, it's not. So I commend to you some of those uh, articles. Uh, there's a uh, bibliography of, of particle matter. I sent it to Sandag two years ago. And, uh, you know, I don't, there are two things I really don't like to do in life. One is make my bed. The other one is rake leaves. I, I've done it. And when I did it, when I had other people around me, I could, I, it was much easier. And we don't want to do the things that we need to do, that we know to do. 
and we think we can get away with not making our beds because mom's not looking. But the reality that I see as a physician, as a scientist, is that we're not doing enough. And just saying we're doing as much as someone else told us to is trying to get away with it to our detriment. Thank you. I think our next speaker will be Catherine Rhodes, who will be followed by Blair Beekman. Um, hello, this is Catherine Rhodes, and this is specifically to Vice Chair Raul Campillo and Supervisor Joel Anderson, because they're the only two people that could actually do something about challenging our strong mayor, Todd Gloria, and his misinterpretation of state law. Specifically, in order to keep, and this is all for homeless issues, specifically to keep the 20th and B tent camping shelter in Balboa Park opened up after um, December 31st, 2023 at the end of the month. And the 20th and the um, old East Street Library run on me for severely mentally ill women with mental illness that is going to be closing maybe even today or this weekend. And without somebody coming and saving and helping these poor homeless people, they're literally going to be kicked out on the street and become more homeless for everybody to um, have to see. And what it is, it, and this is also for Golden Hall, and what it is, is Mayor Todd Gloria's purposeful misinterpretation of state law and the uh, city's deputy chief fire marshal, Anthony Tosca's public safety assessment letters regarding building safety and required investments and improvements and temporary occupancy use permits. For example, the fire marshal said for the 20th and B, you have to have water and electricity instead of just like a little baby generator. You actually have to have water. It's very easy to do. But instead of doing that, Todd Gloria is saying, oh, sorry, it's only temporary. This is the best we can do. The next is for the old E Street Library. You know, right now they have no water, and I believe they, they, they have electricity through a generator. He's Todd Gloria's trying to say there has to be a change in use, but that's not true because government code 8698 gets rid of CEQA um, municipal code changes in use and every other he has. So somebody, please, please help these poor homeless people. Thank you. I think our next speaker is Blair Beekman, who will be followed by the original draw, and the original draw will be our last speaker on this item. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Thanks for the words of Catherine Rhodes. Um, I, for myself, uh, my public comment time at SANDAG meetings these days is usually, or non-agenda public comment time, is usually about the subject of, uh, since, you know, I think part of this strike has been settled drivers are returning to work. I hope we can work on the concepts of uh, morale and um, a morale that is uh, helpful to both drivers and passengers. And I, I've, I've described the importance I feel about the future of uh, developing uh, more buses uh, along routes during a day that I feel can really offer the concepts of uh, speed more than having to rely on speeding up buses themselves, a lot more. It's a lot better program, I think. If every, if in every 10 minutes you can consider, you can hop on a bus, uh, that promotes accessibility. And uh, you can get to places faster, basically. And it, it invites uh, ridership and it invites people feeling more comfortable with buses again. Um, so I, I'm interested in the program, and, I, and there's a real good potential how San Diego can work such a program, maybe not for all lines, but for several. So uh, a good luck to really be considering it. It may not be something for now, but you know, a year or two down the road, planning start starting, but planning now, a year or two down the road, it can be uh, implemented and a really good uh, program possibly. It's my big. Uh, idea. So thanks for again hearing me and hopefully it's re repetition can be good reminders for yourselves of it's uh, good ideas and good uh, follow up uh, on how to consider uh, good mobility ideas before the, the bigger mobility ideas you guys are currently planning for. Thank you. I think our final speaker will be the original draw. You can go ahead. 
uh, in our pursuit to get into all these electric um, vehicles and whatnot, um, you guys need to start looking into the radiation that these um, Tesla charging stations and or even these vehicles are emitting, um, which is completely um, dangerous to the human body. Um, it can actually um, give you radiation poisoning, which um, is similar to the effects of quote unquote COVID. Um, and you guys aren't you know, looking into that while you're pushing that um, we add more of these stations and chargers and get these vehicles, more of them on the road, even with the buses. Um, and they also, these lithium batteries, as I've told you before, when they get, um, you know, when there's an accident and a fire is started, they're not able to be put out in a reasonable amount of time. It takes a lot, tens of thousands of gallons of water. Um, and so as we talk about fire mitigation and, and things like that, you guys need to be um, really doing your own due diligence and looking into the um, hazards that these um, things, um, you know, actually produce in um, the environment um, while you're claiming that you want to preserve the environment. And so that's why you're using them. Um, if you get an EMF reader and you take it over by one of the Tesla charging stations, um, it's emitting off the charts radiation, but when you have one that is uh, the car's actually being charged, it, it gets way higher. So I don't know if you guys need to get your own EMF reader and go test that yourself so that you can see the amounts of radiation that's being emitted. Um, you know, we don't even need 5G towers anymore to be emitting this type of radiation. They're right here um, in front of us um, at a gas station or wherever. Um, and it's very dangerous to the human body and the environment. So you guys need to look into that um, before you push any more of this stuff. Thank you, that concludes the public comments. Thank you, Thank you Francesca. Uh, do we have any member comments? Seeing no hands raised, we'll go to the next item on the agenda, which is, um, agency report from Colleen. Thank you, Chair Shu, and good morning, committee members. It's great to see you all. Um, I have a brief report today. Just want to um, reiterate some of the partnerships and things that we've been doing with other agencies and a tremendous amount of funding that we brought into the region for a number of important projects. So $260 million from the California Transportation Commission. And this is an award that will help us with multiple projects. So in partnership with the Port of San Diego, I saw our Port Commissioner here, um, working on um, Harbor Drive 2.0. So that's really going to help with goods movement to and from the port deploying technology on Harbor Drive, getting some crossings over Harbor Drive to get to address the traffic in that area. So really excited about that. Um, we're also continuing to work with NCTD on the funding that we received, and it was great to have the um, NCTD staff out with us at the press conference at Caltrans a couple of weeks ago. So we're excited about continuing on that as well. Um, we got 2.1 21.5 million to continue work on the Palomar Street rail grade separation. So this is separating the Blue Line trolley at Palomar. This will allow us to get fully through design. It also includes right-of-way acquisition and relocation of utilities. So we're getting closer and closer to having those rail grade separations done that are so important in speeding up the Blue Line trolley from the border into downtown. And I know that's really important to many of us here. I know it's something that's super important to MTS and, and the council member. We were talking about that just the other day how important it is to get these rail grade separations in place. Um, we also celebrated getting a $10 million award from the state for housing, and this is in the San Ysidro area, so in collaboration with the city of San Diego and then an affordable housing developer in the area, there's $10 million going toward that project. So together with the city of San Diego, National Community Renaissance, Casa Familiar, this money will be used to build mixed use affordable housing in this South Bay community. And then the low sand corridor, we wanna thank the city of Carlsbad, led by council member Burkholder for allocating $5.2 million toward eliminating the et grade rail crossing at the Carlsbad station. So again, these rail grade crossing um, separations are super duper important. 
Um, and then in addition, we're very excited to announce that um, we reached an important milestone. And I know Betsy, our legal staff here, helped make this happen along with many other um, agency staff throughout the region and at a national level. But with the General Services Agency and Customs and Border Patrol, we've signed the Memorandum of Understanding with Sandag for the Otay Mesa East Port of Entry. And so what this allows us to do now is to work together on the design of the new border crossing, because we didn't want to get ahead of ourselves actually designing it, delivering it to Customs and Border Patrol, and they say, wait, this doesn't meet the specifications that we need to be able to utilize this. So now we are in collaboration with them, and we'll be working together to design that. So very excited about that. Um, we partnered with Oceanside in the city of San Diego to launch two new neighborhood electric vehicles. I think these are some of the most popular things that are happening. So really taking the concept of flexible fleets and bringing that to life. So we have the Fred downtown. Now we have the, I forget what the bug, does someone know? Beach bug, yeah. So the beach bug that will connect from the Balboa station on mid coast into Pacific Beach. And we're also, um, we launched in Oceanside. I think it's Go Oceanside. So connecting. And I think this is in collaboration also with NCTD. So making the, the connection to the station in Oceanside down into downtown Oceanside. We are also looking at a number of other flexible fleet opportunities. We're going to be bringing forward a report to this committee and then on to the board of directors to continue to get funding for these important projects. And I know this is something important to you as well, um, council member. So that's all I have for the report today. And um, if you have any questions, happy to answer any of those and appreciate all your work and partnership with us to help deliver these important projects. Well, thank you, Colleen. Um, do we have any public comments, Francesca? Thank you, Chair. We do have two public comments. First will be Catherine Rhodes, followed by Blair Beekman. Hello, this is Catherine Rhodes, and I want to thank you guys again for the um, Pacific Beach bug. It's going all over Pacific Beach, and I, I see it working a lot. One thing I, I'm requesting is that instead of um, having parking meter revenue and have new parking meters in Pacific, Pacific Beach to pay for this, that Sandag just pays for it for, for a while in order, um, because I think it would be better for beach access. And then on Harbor Drive 2.0, you know, you guys are just doing things on um, at grade um, on top of the shifting liquefiable soils. And I... I I want to see if you could actually look at my La Playa plan because it could be used for Harbor Drive also. And then one of the big issues is that just recently the law changed to allow the city of San Diego or and then the port of San Diego to actually expand further and build into San Diego Bay. For example, right now the western boundary in downtown is the of the US bulkhead line is at the end of the pier. Now you guys have an opportunity to take a whole entire section, however much you want, of the bay land, submerged lands, and put buildings on it if you wanted to. Um, for example, um, you could have a, a new city hall, you could have a new opera house, you could have a new sand egg headquarters and port headquarters. There's so much room that you guys haven't even looked at or planned for San Diego Bay. And the only thing that you need to do is to make sure that you have the um, the corridor, the ship corridor, so that the ships could go in and out of the bay and have a, um, you know, and have a, a way to get through the bay. But you guys are now allowed to pretty much expand. Um, what I would say is look at where the end of the US bulkhead elevation right now is at the end of the pier. You could double the length of the piers now and go way out into San Diego Bay and use this use this free land that you haven't even thought of before. Thank you so much. I think our next speaker will be Blair Beekman, who will be followed by the original draw. Hi, Blair Beekman. Uh, I wanted to comment on the Pacific Beach Beach Bug. Um, thanks for this program. Um, if it can be really accessible, uh, good luck in those efforts. Good luck in how to continue it, what Catherine Rhodes offered uh, for it to be a free service. I think that should be an important feature for a while, at least to figure out uh, what to do with it in say six months time, uh, to better deal with it, I suppose. 
Um, I, there was some accessibility questions at the previous meeting. I'm not fully understanding the program yet, the project, but um, uh, accessibility is important. And I mean, for the beach bug, I, that should be its key. And if you're spacing out uh, stops where you can only catch it, say every you know five to ten blocks, that's not accessibility. I mean, you got to make things available for people, and to do that along the beach area is just uh, that would be the good program if you would work that way. There was also a comment that it going up to Balboa Avenue uh, Transit Station may make may be a little dangerous. Um, be careful of that, be wary of that, note that, and um, hopefully that can be mitigated and addressed. And um, be careful for riders' safety and uh, how to get up to Balboa Station. Otherwise, to get to Balboa Station, it could provide a really interesting good service, and especially working from Mission Beach to Pacific Beach along that whole a highway there. Good luck how to do that well and make it always accessible and open and uh, good luck. Uh, thanks. I think our final speaker will be the original draw. You can go ahead. Um, as we're talking about these shuttles that are electric vehicles, I mean, we know our cell phones emit radiation and that is something that has a small you know, battery in it, uh, but these vehicles have larger ones. So I'm wondering what the health consequences of them are for the drivers or the people that are using them. And if you're even looking into that um, and maybe you need to assess that before we, you know, keep putting more and more of these on the road and um, putting people in them if they are going to be poisoned by radiation. And also just all this business that we're doing with Mexico when, you know, there's a quote unquote, public health emergency crisis for environment as well with the Tijuana River um, sewage, uh, you shouldn't be engaging in business with them um, on the border until they fix what they're doing because, um, you know, we're basically uh, bringing money to their um, communities, but we're having to pay the consequences of them not taking care of their own sewage um, spills and it's affecting us and yet we still do business with them, give them money because uh, you guys want open borders and whatnot, but you should uh, know that if you did stop, you know, uh, close like close the border just even for one day, they would probably, you know, mitigate that immediately because they need the money from America and vice versa. So, you know, um, instead of moving forward on these projects while at the same time declaring an emergency there, uh, you really need to go to the source of the problem and not just try and get federal dollars or state dollars because this is going to be in an emergency, but really go to the people doing it who you're doing business with and tell them to knock it off or that you're not going to do business with them. Um, it's ridiculous that the people's money continues to get wasted because you guys are doing business with people that aren't doing right by us. Um, so you need to think about that and these electric vehicles, you need to assess the radiation that's being emitted. Thank you, that concludes the public commenters. Thank you, Francesca. Do we have any member comments or questions? Seeing no uh, hands raised for that, uh, we can move on to the SSTAC report from Alex uh, Warner and um, this is with the city of uh, San Diego uh, providing this update and it's through the uh, mobility working uh, group, so Alex. Good morning, Chair Chu and committee members. My name is Alex Warner. I work for the city of San Diego sustainability department uh, with the ADA compliance and accessibility office. I'm the current acting chair of ASTAC, the Social Services Transportation Advisory Council. For those of you who do not know, ASTAC is made up of local transit agencies, service providers, and individuals who have vested interest in transportation issues facing older San Diegos in those with more limited mobility and people with disabilities. At ASTAC recent meeting, we have heard reports and provided input on several SANDAX projects, including flexible fleets pilots, which includes wheelchair accessible vehicles and are available with, the, with a mobile app for those 
with and available with a mobile app for those without a smartphone. Next, generation rapid bus planning, which will include AD enhancements at its stations and on board, including improved crosswalks and bus shelters, as well as level boarding and dedicated wheelchair space on board. And, find, and another project is a sand, another uh, item that we hear is the Sandex grants, including the Specialized Transportation Grant Program and the Access for All Program, which have awarded millions of dollars to several agencies and service providers throughout the region, providing alternative transportation services to seniors and people with disabilities in San Diego, including FA, uh, FACT, MTS, Paratransit, and UNH Family Services. At ASTRAC, we also hear from committee members and the public about unmanned transit needs across the region, both as part of our committee to our more accessible San Diego and to fulfill statutory or legal requirements. Recent discussions regarding unmet needs include the need for ADA compliant bus stops accommodations for the visually impaired and the more ADA transit services in areas where none currently exist. Access to major destinations like Mission Bay Park and East Mission Bay Trails Regional Park via transit. And the need for additional transit operators to, to run full service and improve training uh, processes for those operators. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and we are happy to continue this dialogue with the Transportation Committee to improve relationships and work more productively productively together. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, Francesca, uh, any public comments on this item? <clears throat> Chair, we have no public comments on this item. Any comments or questions from any committee members? Seeing none, we could uh, move on uh, to the consent calendar. Um, so, for the consent, uh, consent calendar, um, any comments or questions from board members first? Um, if if not, I'm going to ask that we pull item five for some discussion, and then we'll, we'll uh, deal with that separately after we deal with the rest of the consent calendar. Um, anyway, um, I don't know, do we have public comment for consent calendar or not? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so let me go ahead and get a motion first. So moving a consent calendar, I'm going to ask that item five be pulled. Do I have a motion to move on the consent calendar? Moreno, any a second? And now we have a public comment. Of... Any public comments, Francesca? Thank you, Chair. We have no public comment. Okay. Okay, and but the council member uh, Will Campillo has a quick comment on it. Apologies, Chair. We actually do have one in-person public comment on item six. Okay, so let's take a public comment for item six, and then uh, council member Campillo has a comment. Uh, Jeff Dosick, if you'd like to step up to the podium, go ahead. Okay, thanks. My name is Jeff Das. <clears throat> My name is Jeff Dasik. I'm a University City resident. I had a question, a couple of questions. Is there a bike priority list for the city in District Six for major roads that originally had Class Two connected bike lanes, and these that they, they no longer exist? We have been told that sometime in the future, these roads will be re-slurried. When will this happen? When, this, when, can be, when can this be done and how can this be sped up? Without these major roadways made safer for the bike commuters, folks in most cases will continue to drive a car. I have four examples of this. Camino Santa Fe between Miramar Road and Carroll Road. Eastgate Mall between Miramar Road and Genesee Road, Regents Road between Genesee Avenue and Ariba Street, and Governor Drive from Genesee Avenue West all the way to 805. 
And if so, will they follow the recommendations from NATCO, the National Association of City Transportation Officials, for all the major intersections? If there's any questions on what I've talked about? Thank you. That concludes the public comments on consent. Thank you, Councilman Capillo. Thank you, Chair, and I'm happy to uh, be approving appro in approval of the consent agenda today. I wanted to take a second to make a few comments about item six. I'm glad to see that we're able to secure more state funding to move critical bike projects forward, including the Bayshore Bikeway. And we must continue to look for these opportunities to fund improving bicycle infrastructure and keeping all modes of travel safe for our region's roadways. And since I joined this committee in early 2021, I voiced my concern regarding the future of projects in the EAP that fall below the $200 million priority funding line within the program. For me, projects like Septon Field in the San Diego River area are critical to connecting our region's bikeways, but because they fall below that $200 million line, the future of this project seems unclear to me. I've been voicing my support for a clear funding plan and strategy uh, to fund the bike EAP projects that are below that threshold. Uh, they have uh, significant importance in many of our communities across the entire county, but because of that threshold, there seems to uh, not be a realistic uh, a realistic uh, sense that they will be completed. The EAP was agreed upon in 2013, and 10 years later, we don't have a plan for those half of the EAP projects. So if a plan uh, is in place or if a plan is being formulated, uh, I think that this committee should have an update on that. I would welcome that opportunity to know about those funding plans. I think that uh, we take all of the EAP projects seriously, regardless of where they rank. And as we move forward with a new regional plan, I'm hoping that the entire EAP, regardless of where they fall on that $200 million uh, threshold divide, are prioritized. Uh, so thank you again, Chair, for that time. And thank you for staff uh, for answering questions from me and my staff. Uh, and over the course of the last week about this and the last several months and years. And I look forward to supporting the consent agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from board members or committee members? If not, uh, so we have a motion by Moreno and second by Edson. You can go ahead and vote. And the balance of the consent agenda, that motion passes unanimously with those members present. Thank you, Francesca. I have a few questions on item number five for uh, our staff, uh, Tracy, and I didn't want to spend a lot of time on it. Um, I'm fine with uh, most of the items um, listed for item five. I just have a few questions with regard to the uh, County of San Diego's withdrawal um, and uh, the letter that we received in that uh, so the one question is, is Tracy, is this the first or second time the county is withdrawing from a, a grant program? Uh, I'm sorry, the, is the first or second? Um, was there another? Uh, um, yeah, uh, yes. Uh, uh, previously, we did um, come to the transportation committee with a um, withdrawal from uh, the Alpine Community Center. Right. So, so there was another similar kind of um, yeah. move by the mm -hmm. planning department. Yes. Um, uh, um, if 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 uh, if I may, if if I may, I just give a little bit of um, project overview uh, of this particular project and a little context. Um, if if I can sure, take please. some time to go ahead. Look. Thank you. Um, in January 2019, uh, the county was awarded 325000 for its Valley Center uh, community plan update. The community plan update would update the content of the existing community plan, focusing on land use refinements, mobility and housing options, and connectivity to the community services within the subregions of the, of the Valley Center. Um, along with this effort was a county initiated Valley Center corridor concept planning project, and that was funded through the uh, through a Caltrans grant, which focused on improving uh, safety and, and enhancements, multimodal mobility options throughout the north and south villages, the subregions adjacent to the corridor. Both planning projects were run in parallel as both planning projects informed one another through uh, community outreach and workshop outcomes. 
Um, attachment four of this uh, report, which is, uh, I think, page 20 of the agenda packet, is a draft early termination memo, which includes attachments providing details on the requested withdrawal, grant balances, and draft closeout letter. Attachment one of that memo is the county's withdrawal request letter, which outlines how the community plan update, which uh, they call CPU, will be used to further the efforts of the corridor concept plan, the CCP, which will remain going forward and is scheduled for adoption by the county supervisors um, next year. Thanks. And I have uh, my grant staff here with me along with the county representative to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Tracy. I didn't want to spend a lot of time on this. Was this item uh, flagged by ITOC, I believe, with regards to the withdrawal? Yes, so in the report, um, I outline um, the concerns that ITOC had. Um, let's see, so at its uh, July 12th, 2023 meeting, the ITOC recommended um, that the Transportation Committee approved the requested Sweetwater Road um, protected bike amendment, which is um, a four month amendment that was that is also a part of this report for you to approve today. Um, but the ITOC also expressed concern regarding uh, the county's Valley Center community plan update withdrawal and the use of grant expenditures to date and provided direction to staff to look at different options of, of, uh, for returning extended grant funds uh, from future grant projects. Great, thank you, Tracy. And I have a question for Betsy, just to clarify. The TC doesn't really um, grant or ungrant uh, <laughs> withdrawals of, of these grants, uh, do we? Yeah, that's correct. Currently, Board Policy 35 gives the Transportation Committee the authority to approve extensions of grant agreements. So if uh, an entity needs more time to perform under the grant, more time could be given by this committee in certain circumstances. But pursuant to Board Policy 17, the authority to terminate a grant is delegated uh, to Hassan and his delegates currently. Um, if a different approach is desired, in Board Policy 35, uh, the Transportation Committee could direct staff to develop uh, draft board policy updates that it could recommend to the Board of Directors. But currently, there's no authority within the Transportation Committee to take any action related to the termination itself. Okay. Thank you. So I want to move along on this item. So I'm going to approve item five with the caveat uh, one that staff uh, look in further into why um, some grant funds were expended, yet the county is pulling back uh, from this, the full commitment um, and whether or not um, the funds were really used um, in, the, in the best way. And that maybe this should warrant some for the review of our granting uh, process. There's only there's limited funds available this funding process. And whenever I see a grant being withdrawn, and this time, the second time by the county of San Diego, it warrants some uh, red flagging that uh, perhaps we need to do a better job of reviewing these grant applications or maybe the grant, uh, the, the agency receiving the grant could have done a better job uh, prior to so they can fulfill uh, the grant agreement. And second, that the staff look into the possibility of the transportation committee in uh, the future time we make an amendment to rule 35 and uh, and that we could actually um, uh, approve or not approve these um, withdrawals. So that's that's my motion. Very long motion. I hope you don't have to write all of that down, but, but I think uh, staff will get the gist of what I'm trying to do <laughs> just for, for the review of the process. Second motion, and, and, and 35. Any further discussion? Just a quick comment on it. Thanks for raising the issue, Chair. I did not catch the ITOC concerns, so I'll look into those afterwards. I just want to make sure I'm reading this clearly, though. The balance of the grant that is not being spent due to the withdrawal is $6,936. I agree that we have you know, concerns of, if, in regarding how the money was spent that should be looked at and or may, may have concerns that should be looked at. But... The one thing is I don't want it to come across as a completely negative thing if someone receives a grant and a, an entity receives the, a grant and they have some funds that they end up not needing. It's actually a positive thing potentially if those are returned, but not if it's for the wrong reasons, I hear you. So anyways, I appreciate yeah. you raising the issue. Thank you. 
Yep, thank you. Um, the retention balance and the PO balance together, about 38,000 will, will go into the next call for projects. Public comment, uh, Francesca? Yes, we do have one public comment okay, on this item. Let's go ahead and take oh, that. Oh, my apologies too, actually. Uh, Tim Bailish will be first and then Catherine Rhodes after. Uh, thank you, Transportation Committee. Um, I uh, heard a lot of the discussion at the ITOC meetings over the past, I think, two meetings about this issue. And I just wanted to offer, I, I have some uh, um, visits with uh, different communities, particularly in Valley Center and some of the development that's going on there. And, and uh, I, I think I've been trying to find a term to address what I think I'm seeing as a, as a public member attending these meetings. And I think it's naivety. The amount of discourse in the last two years in the Valley Center area, talking to individuals at the public meetings, some of the Escondido meetings I've gone to, uh, is incredible. And I would like the committee on, or Sandeg at some uh, effort, uh, make some effort perhaps to understanding the amount of community development that has to go into it. The plans do not seem to me to be integrated for expansion in these areas. There are shopping centers going up kind of willy-nilly. There was, uh, I mentioned at the ITOC meeting, a very contentious uh, presentation for the county uh, engineers putting four roundabouts to try to improve the transportation throughput and safety in the town. And it was met with really quite ridiculous commentary by local people. And that's not to say that they're not interested. And, and But I think we need some guidance. It seems to me over the years, the last two or three years I've been listening, that the cities are not integrating well. And for various reasons I won't discuss, the county has not had the leadership to pay attention to some of this while the engineers have been doing very good jobs. So perhaps Sandeg could find some ways for a better integration. It, again, you know, the other projects that you've had, how much outreach has helped. And I think the local communities, because of COVID even and other things, is feeling a little isolated and defensive about some of these integrative projects. And perhaps that could have a little more attention. So my kudos to the ITOC committees and the uh, people on these projects, how difficult that task has been. I think our next speaker will be Catherine Rhodes. You can go ahead. Um, lovely. Thank you so much. This is Catherine Rhodes. And I, I also want to say if the county doesn't need the money, that's great. It could go to another project. So I actually think this is great. Plus, um, you know, as of um, the end of May 2023, so a couple months ago, San Diego County still had $516 million in cash in the Federal American Rescue Plan app the ARPA funds that are supposed to go to low income neighborhoods. So anyway, the county of San Diego's riches can be and if they don't need this money, that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have two additional speakers, Peter Zaishi and the original draw. Peter, you can go ahead. Yes, my name is Peter Zaishi. I'm here today on uh, as part of the United Taxi Workers of San Diego. Um, we didn't appear yet before your committee when you considered the uh, AFA Cycle 2 grant, but we did attend the board meeting. And uh, we just wanted to let the Transportation Committee know that we're still interested in participating in Cycle 2. Um, we have an on-demand app. We're looking and we're working with the uh, Design Lab at UCSD to see where we can best um, participate in San Diego City and County programs um, that will take advantage of uh, this new taxi meter. Uh, in the taxi industry of San Diego. So we look forward to an update on the AFA Cycle 1 uh, results uh, that are coming up, the, the program that started in June. And uh, we'll be looking with, for ways uh, to participate in this program, given the uh, parameters that the uh, board adopted. Uh, just wanted to introduce ourselves. We've had some communication with the board in writing, but thank you for your work. And um, I'll let you get on with your day. Thank you. Uh, just and let me interrupt for a minute, uh, Peter. I think that you were commenting on the next item of the agenda, so uh, we'll we'll take uh, your comment as just given uh, for item nine. Uh, so, Francesca, do we have another comment for this particular item, uh, item five? Yes, we have one final comment on item five, the original draw. You can go ahead. 
Yeah, I just wanted to say, I feel like a lot of people in the community don't know why projects don't get put forward. They don't understand that all of the different boards within the county, be it city, the county, and, and all of the ones in between are doing things that are making it harder for projects to get completed. And so therefore, if you know, they want more housing, there's reasons why there isn't. If they don't want more, there's reasons why they can't say that they don't and nobody listens. Um, but I think that the roadblocks that are put up, especially say by the county, um, with all of the building and stuff like that, it keeps projects that were already in place from like, you know, 10 or so years ago from me moving forward and the community isn't aware of why that's happening. You know, they see it not happening, but they don't understand that all these new regulations or, um, you know, uh, whatever it is that you have to put out um, that keeps projects from moving forward um, is, is done by your own hands. So, you know, if the community understood that more, I think they would have a clearer understanding of why things happen the way that they do. But most people don't even know about any of these boards. They don't pay attention. They don't know who's dictating things around them until it gets to be too late. And, um, you know, people need to just be more vigilant. Can be aware of what's going on um, and pay attention to these boards so that you're not like, place um but it's you know it's because you guys are incestually in all of these different across the county doing the same thing pushing the same agenda um so anyway whatever that concludes the public comments thank you uh since i took a while to uh give my motion being a long paragraph so let me cl correct that or clarify the issue and simplify the language if i can amend my amendment um or my motion, uh, which is um, to um, uh, approve item five, uh, which is the extension for National Cities uh, grant, grant uh, with a caveat that the staff look further into um, the, the county's withdrawal um, and that uh, uh, as well as looking into the issue of uh, Rule 35. Is that short enough? Um, and if Councilman Campio, if you would agree with that. My second right. remains, thank you. Right. Any other comments? Uh, and and Councilman uh, Duncan, I agree with you. Uh, I mean, the concern is that over 90, 98% of the grant funds are being funded, yet we don't have a product, we don't have a CPU. So that, for any grantor, that should be a concern that we expend um, almost all the grant funds, well, but for uh, 3,000 or so dollars and yeah we don't have a product from the original grant grant so that that's why i think i tap uh, flag that as well okay that's my last comment let's go ahead and vote that motion passes unanimously with those members present Hey, Thank I you. think we're ready to go on to the next item. So um, uh, this is a grants evaluation, evaluation process uh, review by um, Jenny and her findings. Good morning, TC members. I'm really pleased to be here today and present an overview of the process that we use to evaluate our grant applications that we receive and how those funding recommendations ultimately come here for your approval. So my presentation and report also include some best practices that other public agencies are using that we can use to inform changes to our process moving forward. So I wanted to start and give you just kind of a quick overview of our grant programs. We have eight competitive programs that the agency is facilitating. The transit ordinance created four of those, which are shown on this slide. And I just wanted to give you a quick sentence or two about each one. 
Um, it's important to remember that these programs, the board and this committee have really broad discretion about how those are administered and what the funding is used for, which is different from the other four that I'm gonna talk about in a moment. So the first one here is the Active Transportation Grant Program, or ATGP. This is for our local jurisdictions that fund either planning or capital projects that increase walking, biking, and transit use. This program is awarded over $28 million into 87 projects. Uh, the next one is the Environmental Mitigation Program, Land Management Grant Program, or the EMPLMG. This one is for either nonprofit organizations, public agencies, and other organizations that are land managers. And it provides them funding for things like habitat restoration, habitat preservation, and eradication of non-native plant species. For this program, we've given more than $18 million out to more than 136 projects. The Senior Mini Grant Program, or SMG, funds nonprofit and local jurisdiction projects that provide services for older adults. Uh, this program's provided over $24 million since its inception. And then the last one here is the Smart Growth Incentive Program, or SGIP, that funds our local jurisdiction projects for planning and capital that supports smart growth and transit-oriented development. This program's awarded about $59 million to 73 projects. So the other four that we have are funded by other public agency funds, and they're shown on this slide. These are different than the transnet ones because they're required to follow the requirements that are set forth by that funding agency. So anything that we want to do to the process is subject to their approval. We don't really get to control as much of it as we would on the transnet programs. So I'll go through these really quickly for you. Uh, first one is the Access for All program, or AFA. This funds on-demand wheelchair accessible service for individuals with disabilities. It's our newest grant program and is funded by the CPUC. Last year, the board awarded $2.5 million in our first cycle, and we're getting ready to release the second cycle here probably later this month or the first part of August. Oops. Go back. Uh, the second one is the Active Transportation Grant Program or ATP. Uh, this is managed by the CTC and Caltrans. However, SANDAG is required to conduct this competitive selection process for the funding that's allocated to our region. The regional ATP is awarded over 138 million in state and federal funding since 2017. The Housing Acceleration Program, or HAP, is another new grant program and it's funded by HCD. This one provides funding to our local jurisdictions for planning and capital projects that accelerate housing production. Last year, the board awarded 1.9 million in the first cycle and our second cycle is currently out and we're gonna be receiving applications for that in the next few weeks. And then lastly, one of our oldest programs is the Section 5310 program, which is funded by the Federal Transit Administration. This, this funds projects that provide transportation services for older adults and individuals with disabilities. We've awarded over 38 million in federal funding through the program since 2006. So on this slide, I'm just giving you kind of a brief overview of what the call for projects process looks like. The overall steps are shown here and important to note are the places where the TC and the board have influence on the process. There's two main steps. Uh, first is the call for projects development, which is step one on here. This is where we go over the program goals, the objectives, the evaluation criteria, criteria, eligibility, and other nuances of the program, setting forth what's going to be pushed out for our applicants to apply for. From there, uh, the middle sort of steps that are on here, we release the call for projects, we receive applications, we review those and we evaluate them using the criteria and all the other requirements that were put in the call for projects. And then the results of that process come back here to the TC and the board as the uh, request for approving those funding recommendations. And then the last step is when we move into implementation of projects. You do have involvement there as we saw in the prior item to review time extensions or other things going on with the grant program as we do our quarterly status updates. 
So I wanted to kind of recap, why are we here? So when we were considering the funding recommendations for our most recent specialized transportation, which is Senior Mini and 5310, and we were talking about the Active Transportation Program or the ATP, the committee had questions for us regarding the process. And they kind of composed three main topic areas that I've kind of summarized on this slide. So evaluator training, evaluator bias and consistency, and project and funding ranking. So today's item is to provide you with the results of the research that we did and to talk about places where we could make changes to our process to adjust these concerns and questions that you have. So to answer your questions, we went out and researched a whole slew of federal, state, and local agencies that have grant programs to see what are they doing, how do they import best practices, and what portions of that could we use in our program. Uh, there's a lot of variance, as you would imagine, across the different programs, and not all of them are described either comprehensively or they don't reveal it publicly. Some of them are very kind of closed off about how they want to reveal, especially the last piece, how they allocate funding. So I grabbed as much of that as I was able to obtain for you and summarize that in the discussion memo, and I'm going to go through those results here with you. So there's a whole slew of findings that you'll find in the discussion memo. I just kind of wanted to pull a few of those highlights out to introduce the topic today. Um, these are the main areas where I thought we could improve our process. So the first one is that many of the organizations that we sampled require the evaluators to obtain a mandatory training session that the agency is offering. It ensures that all the evaluators get the same information. They have an opportunity to ask questions. It's a very interactive part of the process so that they leave and they fully understand the work that they're going to be doing and everybody's sort of on the same playing field from the beginning. It ensures that everyone has the same foundation and it helps kickstart that process off. Second is that the level of detail that's in a scoring rubric or evaluation criteria, the terms are kind of used interchangeably, um, is very broad. In some cases, there's point ranges and there's detailed criteria with definitions and scoring strategies that help distribute the points. Agencies that get a lot of applications, so CTC, Caltrans, the federal government, they have really, really detailed rubrics that have evaluative criteria. They have really high high quality definitions of what each of those mean, what different levels can be in there. And there's a scoring strategy that tells you how points are awarded. So it's less subjective in nature and it's really more objective. So the rubric helps reduce the amount of time that an evaluator is scoring because they have something very well defined that tells them what to score. And it removes some of the objectivity that happens in the scoring process that can help eliminate variance. And it helps provide a framework as well for applicants. If you're not successful, you can see exactly where a project maybe could have improved or where they lost points because you're going to see the same assistant information across all your evaluators. And there's going to be those clear delineations for you. And then the last one is that we have evaluator meetings following that review to ensure that there's consensus among the evaluators on how they see scores. So some agencies have, if there's more than a specific variance, like 5% or folks score on the really extreme high ends or low ends of applications, those are things that are talked about in that meeting so that you can understand why did somebody see something versus someone else and to try and get consensus. Because it could just be when they're reviewing a pile of applications, they miss something. It's human error that happens. So the most surprising thing that I found was that there was no other agency out there that uses a ranking process that establishes that final application order. And that's a hallmark of what we do here. I think the reason for this is the fact that a lot of them are using this detailed rubric with all of these definitions and this enhanced training and the discussions with their evaluators because this helps ensure that you've got consistency across your scores and there's no need to normalize them using a rank. The other thing that was interesting was that most agencies are fully funding their applications in order of that list. 
until that funding is exhausted. And there was really only a few of the federal agencies that use a secondary evaluation process to kind of hone in on applications and try and decide how they allocate funding if there's some nuances in there or for programs that are really oversubscribed, that's a process that they use. But it's not consistent across all the different funding agencies that are out there, which is really interesting. And then the last piece is that geographic distribution is really broad. It depends program by program. So it's either set by a geographic limitation, and I kind of gave you some examples in the report, or it's through a set aside in a particular category or thing like that. And it's going to vary from program to program and call for call and is something that would get looked at really more detailed as you're working on a call for projects, rather than setting an overall process that you would use on every single program every single time. So our item today is for discussion. Um, I'm going to be taking the same report to the Regional Planning Committee in September, and I want to use Autolize this feedback to develop our future calls for projects in our upcoming grant cycles. So on this slide, I'm giving you here's the eight programs, our next cycle number that's coming up, just so, for some context for you, and then when we anticipate that that would be coming to this committee for these broader discussions about the criteria, the eligibility, how you want to allocate funding, all of those pieces and nuances on them. Um, that's all that first step that I mentioned earlier. And one thing I wanted to point out that's on here is the last program HAP. You might notice that it says it's unknown and there's no identified funding. So this program is funded through HCD. It's the Regional Early Action Planning Grants. And we don't know if they're going to have a future cycle of that funding provided to us. If we find out more information or if we know for sure that they will, then we would have another cycle of it. But as of right now, we really don't know. Um, so that's the reason that one is kind of questioned on here is we're not incredibly sure what's going on with that program, but we'll find out here. And this committee will know obviously what's happening as we do our status updates. So that concludes my report. I'm happy to answer any questions. And I have all of my program managers here in the room if you have specific questions about one of their program or nuances on them. And I will give it back to the chair and be happy to answer any questions you might have. I think, I think Colleen had some comments as well. Yes, yeah, so I really want to thank Jenny for this report. And we know this is something that's been very important to this committee. What are the criteria that are used for giving out grant funds? And this is a big part of our budget. Those of you on the board who saw our billion dollar budget, about a third of the budget gets passed through to local jurisdictions, both through your portion of Transnet but also through these competitive grants. So this committee has a lot of responsibility when we bring forward draft criteria for how to allocate the funds. And we try really hard, and this is where we'll look for your input um, going forward, to make it as objective and transparent as possible so that it's really, you know, the criteria comes out, then points for each of the different criteria, and then where does it fall in the line, which projects get funded and which ones don't. So that's really what we're looking for here. Again, it's getting evaluators oftentimes can be very difficult because we don't pay anybody to do this work. And so usually we're looking for jurisdictions who do not apply to have some of their staff members sit on the review panel with us. Other agencies will tap into Caltrans from time to time um, to serve on these review panels. But again, we know this is really important funding because it gets to things like um, what you were saying, Councilmember Campillo, how do we fund these really important projects, whether it's these are the bike and ped projects, these are the programs that really make an impact on people's day-to-day -day lives in their communities, and we recognize the importance of that. So thank you for your attention in this, and we really look forward to input as we move along to make these as robust as possible. Thank you, Colleen. Um, Francesca, do we have any public comments? We do have one public comment on this item, the original draw. You can go ahead. So I guess, you know, my issue with grants and all this stuff is that you guys are doing anything you can to seek money. You guys love money. You talk about it all the time. You love your budgets. You love to play with your monopoly money when you're dictating things that, you know, what you can buy with it. And so I find that it loses its value. But the thing is, is that you guys have to play to get paid. And so you have to play the game of the federal and state government in order to get these funds. And it has nothing to do with like 
what you're pushing, which would be climate and all of this stuff. And like, you know, we got to get people to put dry. If, if the uh, narrative was reversed and you could get paid for saying no to the climate, um, saying no to all the COVID scams, like all of the, you would be doing that because your idea is that you want the money. It's not really about like helping people and doing what's right because if that was so, then you wouldn't be seeking to get people into electric vehicles that are um, emitting immense amounts of radiation. Um, you wouldn't, um, you know, say that for the climate, we're going to be using lithium batteries when they're completely toxic. And also, you know, they can't even be put out in the fire. So, you know, it, it all has to do with the money and that's the problem. So, you know, if the narrative was flipped, you'd be riding that train too. Um, because that's where the money would come in. Um, and, and that's just what's so sad is that it really doesn't have anything to do with making things better. It's just about how much money you can get. And in order to do that, you have to push a narrative because if you didn't, you wouldn't be getting any of the funds. And that's why San Diego always wants to be first in everything. You want all the money to do all this stuff that you're really not even going to do. I mean, everything continues to get worse no matter how much money we get. No matter how much you throw at it, because you get rid of the problems, there is no money. That's why the problems have to stay. That's why you can never get rid of them. You guys will lose all the money that you have. That concludes the public commenters on this item. Thank you. Um, so, member comments, questions, and discussion on this item. Uh, Councilman Moreno. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I think. Uh, one of the things uh, that Sandag does really, really well is um, is uh, grants. I, I often state, and I've often stated in the city of San Diego to use Sandag as an example. Um, I think Otay Mesa too is, is the prime example of this. I do recognize that we're conduits in this circumstance for um, grant uh, for grants, right? Uh, but I'm just curious to know. Um, I'm curious to know how much and this is a lot of information especially because there are so many grants and i'm not sure how we digest this but how much money we've actually put out into the community how many projects have actually gotten built uh based on these grants um and also um i used to chair the equity working group what do we have a higher score if uh, if a particular grant is um, focused in a community of concern, if we don't, I think that would be something that we take into consideration. Um, also, um, do we get administrative uh, funds for these grants? Usually, there's a two percent or a you know a certain percentage. Do we receive? Yeah, most of them do. There's some sort of admin fee that lets us administer the program. Okay, and why are we not using those funds for the people to, uh, I'm going to say the word judge, judge the grants? The evaluators? Evaluate the we grants. Could, that's you. an option we could take is to compensate our evaluators. It might help with getting different folks on the panel. Yeah, and then also, um, you know, who's applying for these grants? Um, I've often thought that the city of San Diego doesn't apply as much as we should be. That's just my humble opinion, um, especially, uh, you know, these are important funds, especially for the seed money of projects, of capital improvement projects. It's really difficult to get projects off the ground um, when we don't have funds, especially in communities of concern, because there's not a lot of um diff funding or whatnot. Um, so I am curious, um, I don't know if you could come back at another time and share some of the data for us, uh, just maybe extrapolate the past year, past two years, just to see what's going on. I'd be very curious to see who's who's applying for this money, how many projects have actually been completed, um, How what happens if the projects aren't completed? Do they just stay or do does the money get returned to sandag um and obviously if we have issues with people evaluating grants i think we should absolutely look at that administrative fee and to recap have an equity lens um in in these grants as well in these particular grants also how do we um i know for the environmental grant I know that's part of the transnet funding, right? That was the stipulation. That was the agreement with the environmental community. Um, and I've been told by environmental, um, by the environmentalist 
don't touch our money as the city of San Diego. So I recognize that. But um, how do we um, let the community know that there are grants out there, um, especially for the smaller nonprofits? I know that uh, one of the things that um, Sandag has been pushing, and I, I commend them, I commend us on it, is the digital divide. Um, oftentimes we just, you know, check a box and say, hey, we put this grant out, we let you guys know. Um, and I would welcome us to kind of reach further and maybe have some kind of component for outreach for some of these nonprofits, um, whether it be through the equity working group or other um, other sources. But um, that would be my feedback. Do you do we have any of that data that I asked for? We do. We have a lot of that data. Some of them I can tell you right now. We don't have projects that don't complete. If we do, I would say the two withdrawals that we sort of talked about today, those are them. We really monitor all of our projects, as you see in the quarterly updates, where are projects progressing, pushing them forward, finding out what the issues are, if it's just a time extension, bringing that here, or trying to help them. If it's something that Sandig does really well, we implement a lot of projects maybe there's something we can influence. So that's really not a factor here in terms of completion of projects. Um, we do have a lot of data. We get really good um, oversubscription for most of our grant programs of who's applying. I can certainly come back and bring you know who they are and what does that look like for program to program. Um, advertising and outreach is a big component of what we do. So we bring up through our working groups where we touch a lot of these folks. Each program, they also have their other committees that they work with. We are doing community outreach in those areas, depending on who's eligible for them and getting that message out. And we do it informally through discussions and channels that we already have. So I feel like we do a really good job, but it's something we can certainly look at and bring to you as we start talking about the next cycle and say, here's who's been applying, where do we think we might need to target? Is there other places that we're missing to get that information out in the community? And lastly, how do we compare to other agencies? Are we getting less money, more money per per, um, per resident mm -hmm. in the state of California? I think that would be something interesting. I often find... Um, once again, going back to my reference for the city of San Diego, things are changing, right, Raul? Things are changing. We are applying now, uh, but for many years, we just, we left so much money. Um, I know we're not doing that here, but the city of San Diego left so much money uh, that was absolutely meant for us, right? So, um, yeah, how do we compare with other agencies? That would be another kind of follow-up question. And maybe I'm the only one that wants to know this information. So I'm happy to meet with you or bring it back, however the chair uh, decides. But thank you for the presentation. This was very insightful. May I make one comment? Um, sure. Share it to the council member. So what you're bringing up is a really good point. So what we're talking about here is funding that SANDAG allocates through our grant programs. We also go out and get funds, and that was one of the things I was talking about in our agency report. Since 2021, we've brought in over a billion dollars. So that's another report that we could bring to you. And so who are we collaborating with? So the work that Jenny and her team does is truly amazing. They give out grants, they're the ones who are coordinating these incredible applications to get the big federal dollars. And this most recent um, allocation that we got from the California Transportation Commission, usually we get about 8% of grant funding available. And that round, we got 15%. So we're getting more than our fair share. And that has a lot to do with the team here who is amazing in writing these grants and just the work that our kind of legislative team does in Washington and in Sacramento to bring as many dollars as we can to the region. So maybe at some point we want to bring forward that report on kind of the, the money that's coming to the region, who's applying, what are we applying for, and how does that lay out? Well, and, and you just made a a very poignant um, fact. Um, you said that it sounds like these grants are based on, um, oh my gosh, I can't think so of the word. So this is mainly transnet. Yes. A lot of it is transnet that we're passing through. And gotcha. in the but you still, you have the CPUC up there as well. And you have the TCT up there, right? So that's my, my question is, are we getting yes. is it a form is it a formula based you know based on the cpuc and is that formula just right are we getting yes. the same amount as the, uh, the city of la the same amount as the city of or the region of san jose mm -hmm. like i said you just brought up the ctc that we were getting eight now we're getting 15 so you know these are the things that i'd like to take a deeper dive in and and just see um 
why not push for more? Yep. Right. I know on the La Media project, when the city of San Diego applied for twenty two point seven million dollars, I lobbied the CTC. I, I met with the past executive director and we did have issues when it came to the committee. Um, so, you know, we're legislators. I, I want more money. That's my point. So <laughs> thank you, though. And they're all formula based. The only exception is the AFA, and that's driven by the money that's generated here as folks are taking Uber and Lyft trips. But all of it is either formula based, and it's usually our 8% share or on the FTA side, it's going to be a little bit different. But yes, it's driven by that. It's not us applying, getting funding, and then trying to figure out how to give it out. They're telling us exactly how much. Councilman Metzen? And well, I'm sorry, did I? Maybe say something that you could tap out. Okay. okay, I'll continue next. So uh, Edson and then Duncan and then uh, Mayor for Kranz. Well, thank, thank you very much, Chair, and, and thank you for your comments, um, Councilmember Moreno. Thank you, Jenny, for the report. Um, I noticed throughout the, this discussion memo, great work, really appreciate it. Um, read it, put me to bed twice. Good. Um, throughout here, I, I noticed comments with regard to the scoring rubric and um, comments that the detail included could be more enhanced to align with scoring rubrics used by other agencies, um, that more defined scoring rubric with a more defined scoring rubric that evaluator scores could be more closely aligned to reduce the variances that we've seen in the past and um, eliminate, you know, personal scoring preferences and stuff. Um, and uh, so throughout here, you know, a more detailed scoring rubric would remove variances. So page page after page. So I definitely think that's a direction that we should be going in. And I really appreciate you doing this deep dive and providing all of this information to us. So that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman Duncan. Thank you for <clears throat> excuse me for your report today. I, I appreciate it, and I find it all you know pretty interesting and in looking at ways to make a process better is always uh, a great thing for me. And I think from, you know, some of our, maybe our prior brief discussions or some of the other meetings, I think you might know one of my um, key considerations is trying to understand what are the rules around what the board is allowed, our committee and then the board allowed to do. So when you say, you know, some are more restricted, some are less restricted. You know, that's a concept, and I'm sure you're 100% right, and I appreciate knowing that, but what does that really mean in regard to what happens when we review the grants is something I'd like to know more about as the process goes forward. Um, for me, again, I, I agree with you, and I'm sure all the committee members and board members agree they want the process to be as objective as possible. However, the other side of that, though, is still, as it sets forth here, committee members were provided and subsequently the board is proposed funding recommendations so if that's truly what they are is recommendations then that means you know the board retains some power if they disagree with a recommendation or they want to modify a recommendation so what i am interested in and i would had some discussion a little bit with council about actually seeing you know what are the literal restrictions and rules on us. We obviously don't want to do anything that's inappropriate. We also obviously want to take into account, you know, public, um, you know, transparency and fairness. But I really still want to know more about if when we get everything back, because ultimately, it's a certain amount of somewhat anonymous evaluators. And even with the best objective process, there may periodically, hopefully never, but there may periodically be times where the board is like, wait a minute, there is an outlier here or, or something's changed that may be in our duties as board members and committee members that we learn about even subsequent, you know, to the to the grant process um, that we want to in our role, you know, what we do um, change slightly or, or award slightly differently. So that's of what is my big interest that I would still like like to know and and have more information on that. 
again, I mean, the scenario is pretty straightforward. If we have one grantee that, or you know, grant applicant, I should say, that slightly misses a cut, and there's some reason why the board, and I think the board is objective in the sense that it's not going to be just like a special interest for whatever South County or for Coronado when I'm on the board. Um, you know, I'm not going to be able to get something through that's just some personal project, you know, with all the, you know, strong personalities and jurisdictions and legislators there. It would have to pass all of it. So anyways, I, I don't mean to belabor it, but I just wanted to be clear with with what I think, not just myself, but on a few unanimous votes we've had here in committee and at the board, I think there's there's a strong interest for this information. But I appreciate, I do appreciate what you provided. Thank you. Grants. Yes, thank you, um, and I appreciate the uh, the fact that you provided the date at which we directed uh, uh, staff to prepare this analysis, um, because it allowed me to go back to the agenda. And I remember that it was a fact um, grant application that was not recommended for funding, and I pulled up the table from that, and I remember, you know, I'm seeing that uh, what happened in that particular instance is that $900,000 worth of vehicles for um, MTS, which I'm sure they desperately needed that money for those vehicles, um, was uh, ranked higher than these two other, three other uh, applications, one of which was um, the fact. And it was weird because the average score of those MTS grant applications was lower than the fact and then i guess apparently there was the uh, sum of ranks that came into play there and some of these other things that are uh, a little hard for me to kind of track so you know maybe i'm more dense than most math is not my best subject and and so some of these things just don't add up that was a uh, a, a well-scored grant application and it was not recommended for funding so some of what I'm interested in is similar to council members' interest, which is where does the um, the board have the opportunity to, um, you know, true this up a little bit so that a very worthwhile grant application isn't left out of the funding uh, completely. And I couldn't figure out from the report that we have today um, where we have that flexibility. Um, and so that is something that I'm hoping we can we can get clarity on because I think it's pretty important. There's no question that all these grants um, are providing a service and a, and and uh, very worthwhile. Um, and I believe we're working on finding funding for fact for this particular grant to true that up. But uh, in the meantime, I think it works a lot better if out of the gate we're getting a uh, recommendation from staff and the evaluators that um, means that we won't have to go back and try and figure out where to find the funding. So um, I appreciate the effort that went into this report. It, it, it's broader than I had expected given the origins of the request, but uh, like Council Member Moreno, I am very interested in getting more money from these agencies. So um, I appreciate all the work that everybody does. Last one, Campillo, and then back to Duncan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and thank you very much, Jenny, for uh, going so deep into this topic. I know we brought this up over uh, two meetings uh, at this committee, and uh, I, I really appreciate the depth of the research on this. Uh, I, I really uh, really agree uh, with uh, Council Member Duncan's uh, points there. I think that if it's one of the key components was knowing if we didn't have discretion to change something, that there was an opening up of liability given the stated process. And so in agreeing with my colleague's point that where we can retain discretion, it seems to me that as long as we were to put into the criteria for these grants, that ultimately the recommendation uh, or rather the final determination was with the board that we could essentially insulate ourselves from that litigation. 
Um, I don't know if, if, if it was, this was, if the research was done in this case, and it also had maybe a legal component too, that got into that aspect of it. I remember focusing a lot on the legal component of why we didn't want to adjust things. Right. Um, so always trying to protect the agency's, uh, ability to make decisions that fit the needs of our constituents. I think I would ask, uh, to know ultimately what that determination on the legal aspect would be. The second thing I'd say is I, I keep finding myself going back to the idea that the ranking was ultimately the thing that uh, rankled me the most because of the averages of the scores uh, showing, you know, a, a certain set of uh, scores and then the ranking uh, undoing those in, in, in my view, undoing those. Um, I, I, my opinion would be that we do away with the ranking and, and leave it to the averages uh, of the scoring uh, as a way to assuage the potential inherent bias of any any um, person who's looking at the criteria or uh, the, the scorers in essence. Um, I don't think there's any way to get rid of every single potential uh, inherent bias that a person might have just in, given their life experience, analyzing different components of an application. Um, and, uh, and, and it would be very difficult to do that though, no matter how much training we give them. Uh, I think that the method of averaging is essentially how we cross that bridge across multiple evaluators. So that would be what I would suggest as, as going forward in the future, leaving it to the, to the, uh, simple averages as to who would get the funding. And then, uh, I'll, I'll stop right there chair, but I really do want to say, I, I, I'm very, very, uh, grateful for how serious you took our comments at the committee meeting several months ago and came up with this really in-depth report. Very, very good work. Thank you. That's one Duncan. Uh, thank you. Just very briefly, I won't do a long speech like my last comment. Um, I appreciate the comments that were just made by the other committee members. Um, I have a, a slight concern that with whatever changes are made, with whatever we use for best practices in the future, that if they're like, I like to see the base scores too. Then that's part of if we're going to exercise any discretion, sometimes more information is actually better than less so that we have you know, more knowledge of what we're, what we're potentially going to do. Um, and I know that that can be aggravating at times, right? Because it does cause more questions for staff and it, it can be a little bit difficult, but I think it can be helpful with obtaining the best results. So I just, my desire and maybe not be others, but as we go forward with, if, the, if I'm understanding it properly, reviewing ways to make it you know, our grant process and the evaluators participation, the, you know, the best possible and making some potential changes, um, not just to training, but in regard to some other items that that's certain, I would like to see the raw scores of, of all the evaluators as, as well. Yep. And I just to follow up on the other comment was, and I'm not trying to overly put you on the spot, but do you know, are we looking still separately at that one fact funding issue that was bifurcated? We are. So Brian and I are going to bring an item back in September discussing the long-term funding and the options that could be taken here. We've also identified short-term funding for them that we'll mention in the report and we're in discussions with FAC to kind of inform what that would look like and get some information from them. But we're definitely working on that. It's taken a little bit of time to kind of unwrinkle some pieces of it, but it's coming here in September. Yeah, and I really appreciate that. I just want to say when we ask direct questions, you know, of you, I is definitely not any critique of what you I mean, I love how you present. I appreciate your your effort and your knowledge. And um, you know, but when we have if we have a question about something that maybe it seems appears not to be happening, it's definitely not personal. And we really appreciate your help. And Absolutely. I think you do a great job. But um yeah, sometimes when things take a while, I, you know, the more we ask these questions to get the answers, the, the, I think the better it is for the whole, the whole committee and the board as well. So thank you very much. Sure. Zito. Yeah, thanks. And I'll add my voice to saying thanks for bringing this. This was very interesting, useful, and helpful. 
Um, I, I did want to, based upon some of the discussion that's happened today, uh, and, and just to add a comment, I did like uh, the vice chair's comment about maybe looking at not using ranking, but I think if we were to do that, we would have to go more to these models of having a normalizing discussion among the evaluators. And, and if you guys had some analysis of the pros and cons of each approach, that would be interesting to look at as well. But I also wanted to broach the fact that I think as a body, we need to be aware of the value of a purely objective exercise. And yes, there is no such thing as a perfect process. We all know this. And um, I appreciate the comments of all that my colleagues on the board, um, but we do realize that any process is gonna have its failures. And in this instance, uh, we didn't like the failure, which was the issue with fact, but we're addressing it. It creates more work, it's a pain in the butt, but we are trying to address it. And I just wanna know that, I just want us to internalize that um, if we go to a process that allows some discretion, which is what we've talked about, um, that could create worse failures. I mean, if you envision a future where it goes to the board, because if we have discretion, I assume the board could have discretion, and a project is taken away from one jurisdiction and given to another one through a weighted vote, that would not go over very well, right? That would be a huge problem, and I would consider a much bigger failure than what we have right now. So uh, we should just keep that in mind and consider as we're going forward, talking about this discretion thing, which I'm happy to hear the analysis, but I would also wanna hear, it's like, if we were to go that approach, can we say it has to be a unanimous vote or there has to be other protections put in place that would allow it to be, you know, to, to prevent it from being abused, which I'm not going to accuse anybody in the current uh, board of doing that, but, you know, we're trying to create a process that would work well uh, going forward for a while. Thanks. Any other comments from committee members? If, if not, I have a few. <laughs> Hopefully I'll keep them brief, but I'll start with a quote. Uh, there was a long ago, um, going back in the history of uh, Sandag, there was uh, one of the Sandag board members, uh, one that had been here for a long time, uh, say that um, what we do with grants or funding is that uh, we have a process and then the projects come to being for funding, and then ultimately the politicians get involved and pick what we want through some political process. So I think we're we've gotten much better than that. So I appreciate uh, uh, your work. Um, um, I have uh, several comments. Uh, one is um, first of all, do the, our um, uh, evaluators do they get a stipend? Currently, they do not. They're all volunteers. Um, we validate their parking and feed them food. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe I, some I, favors is about as much as we could get from right. them. I, it's a lot of begging. <laughs> sure. So I think, you know, some some uh, look at uh, if there is such an opportunity to give them some stipend that might be uh, warranted, particularly if they're spending, you know, days and days on, on this issue. And, and now that you're suggesting additional training for them, that's even more of a kind of commitment of time. Um, and the other is that uh, we're, we're picking evaluators that know the topic uh, and have getting more training and being fully objective. Can we give them, and I'm just suggesting this is something to look into, is some flexibility uh, of, of funding so that um, it's not all none type of thing with each grant. Uh, so I think that's something that we might look into. There may be some parameters around that so that uh, a project that got funded less than the one that got funded may have some elements that we do want to fund. So the evaluators can then uh, have some flexibility in making some changes uh, so that all the grant funds are, are being put uh, to the best use. Um, in other grant programs I've been into involved with in the past, particularly if the grant application is very long and takes a lot of staff work. Um, uh, the grantor asks for letters of intent. Uh, so what they do is way in advance before the grant application process starts, ask potential uh, applicants, give us a letter of what your project is, what you intend to do, limited to no more than five pages with some data. That gives um, us a chance to look at them, see some projects just Aren't, it's not worth for them to apply, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, so that saves the community lots of time, but it also gives time for the you give them initial comment. You know, that's a project that we we can fund, but there, there's a few things that are not going to fly. Uh, that gives the grant applicant uh, a clue of 
uh, how they could do, write a better grant application and ultimately a better project for us to fund. Uh, so that might be something to look into, particularly for grant uh, applications that require a lot of work. Uh, so, so I think a lot of community organizations um, uh, like that. Um, and I like the idea of, of um, uh, less emphasis on the ranking, but more emphasis on on the score for all of us to, to look at. I think that's great. I really appreciate the openness that Sandag is taking in revealing uh, these numbers uh, and being open to talk about it as well. So I think that's really good. And lastly, I'll make a final note that um, I made a motion that was seconded by um, Councilman Duncan at a board meeting when dealing with legislative priorities. And one of them was to increase um, our advocacy to increase the amount of funding that we would get uh, for uh, specialized transportation uh, grant funds. So hopefully we'll have more, more money uh, so that the more of these, uh, particularly in that program, that we, we, we have sufficient funds. I don't know, it seems like the demand for specialized transportation is growing. We're not meeting the nearly the, what we need to do. So uh, hopefully we'll have more money to provide in, in that particular program. Any additional, this was a discussion item. Any other last minute comments? If not, we can move on to the next item. I mean, unless you had a question, uh, Jenny. Not a question, but maybe to help. So some of the programs have really nuanced. You brought up specialized transportation. My thought is that when we bring calls forward, they may not all look the same because there may be more information that you want to know about a particular program versus another one that maybe is really straightforward and easy to follow. So those might be ones I envision that discussion maybe being a little bit longer and more detailed because that's when we would bring to you how many evaluators are we seeing on this or how many applicants do we not have enough funding and we really want to have more discretion on this particular program versus another it might be a better place for some of that to sit because it's more situational and you'll have a better grasp of what's going on because right now we're kind of up here on the high level and it's hard to get into that detail so i do think they're related, but they're sort of two separate things that we're talking about here. And I think that might help on the programs that we have a really strong interest in, or we're really trying to make shifts like specialize and how would we partially fund a project, maybe to find the best use. That's how I think we could do that in a better way, because you'd have a lot more information to kind of grab onto and see what that would look like as an outcome. Great. Thank you very much for the report, Jenny. Thank you very much. Uh, next uh, is item number 10, uh, the 2022 State of the Commute Report. And we have for both Grace and Connor uh, here to provide us an overview uh, of the report. Good morning. Chair, Vice Chair, and all the Transportation Committee members and members of the public. My name is Grace Mino. I'm Principal Research Analyst here at Sandeg. I'm also pleased to introduce Connor Vaz, who's an Associate Data Scientist here at Sandeg and has been working behind the scenes on the state of the commute since 2021. Um, I just want to preface before starting that Connor and I are not the subject matter experts on the topics being presented. However, we are the data analyzers and the data wranglers, but our subject matter experts are here in the room with us. So if any questions come up um, during our presentation or afterwards, they, uh, they, are, they will be coming up to help um, answer those. So just a, a quick overview of what we'll be presenting today. We're going to just give a quick background of the transnet ordinance and the state of the commute. We're going to give a quick overview of updates made to the 2022 state of the commute. Uh, then we'll go over the results and then we'll discuss next steps. I'm not going to read this to you, but this is actual transnet ordinance on the state of the commute report. And what we put in the state of the commute reflects what we're mandated to do. And a lot of the indicators have been added and removed throughout the years. And um, I just want to note that this is a point in time snapshot of what's happening in our region. 
And so just a quick background of the state of the commute. Um, after voter, voter approval of the Transnet extension, the state of the commute report started in 2005. I want to highlight our longstanding partnership with Caltrans and MTS and NCTD as staff had defined the performance measure indicators that were in the state of the commute report. And since then, we've completed nine reports, five info bits, and now one data dashboard. A quick background, um, in 2018, we had a triennial um, audit and there was recommendations from that audit. There was a list of 40 recommendations, 28 of those were related directly to performance monitoring. And I just wanna um, give an update on the progress that we've made in response to the 2018 triennial audit that SANDEG has been working on establishing a strong performance framework. And some of those actions that have been taken is in 2020, all performance monitoring was uh, moved to one division. In 2022, we've been creating a regional safety dashboard. In 2022 and 2023, we've been obtaining big data to analyze congestion and delay on our local streets and roads. In 2023 and in development now through 2024, we're developing bridge and pavement dashboards. And in 2023 and 2024, we'll be adding a performance monitoring module for local jurisdiction data collection. And so items that have been added since 2020, um, we did a transnet description, we have an overall commute trend summary icons with stats, uh, we've included senior mini grant statistics, regional bikeway mileage and regional bike counts. Items added in 2021 were traffic volumes in the most congested highway locations for morning and peak period times, and also safety data for motorists, bicycles, and pedestrians. New for 2022 is big data for congestions and mobility on arterial roads. We also added bridge data, pavement data, and all of the data is now available in our open data portal, and data is electronic in a dashboard format. Um, the ITOC subcommittee had reviewed and provided feedback and those changes have been made. We've also met with MTS and NCTD staff who have reviewed and also with Caltrans prior to the publication of this dashboard. Um, ITOC has also approved this dashboard during their June 14th meeting. And so our state of the commute transition from paper to data dashboard. For those of you who still like paper, you have a one page summary at the dais for you to still review. But the data dashboard is a way for us to still continue to be an innovative, a data driven agency and for data transparency and integrity. So for those of you who wanna follow along, you can scan the QR code and I'm gonna pass now the presentation to Connor Vaz who will go over our safety, I mean, our uh, state of commute dashboard. All right, thank you very much for that, Grace. Um, and uh, thank you again, everybody, for having us. My name is Connor Voss. I'm my uh, data scientist working underneath Grace. And as Grace mentioned, um, I've been working on the state of the commute for the past couple of years. And uh, also wanted to uh, kind of emphasize what uh, Grace mentioned about uh, the conversion from a paper report over to the uh, dashboard version that I'm going to be presenting you today. Um, some of the features I'm going to highlight very briefly just show you some of the interactivity that allows this information to be not only a lot more digestible, but a lot more concise and uh, our ability to report more information while making it easy to understand for all of our end users. Um, so right here, what I'm showing you on the screen here is the state of the commute story page that we have here. And so I'll just go ahead and highlight a couple of things as far as interactivity on the dashboard. First and foremost, for those of you who haven't been introduced to the open data portal before, um, it has a lot of really cool features. Um, as you can see, each one of these visuals has little flyouts that as you hover over individual data points, it shows you uh, exactly what information is being depicted. And then in addition to that, for those who prefer to view their information in table format, as opposed to in to, uh, visuals, you're able to select options to view the data as presented in the table format. So. A lot of really cool features. Certain visuals are allowing you to filter by different uh, metrics that are pre-selected. But at the end of the day, it's called Open Data Portal for a reason because you're able to download and access all of this information with all of the corresponding metadata for all of this information, making this one of the most transparent reports that we've put out for the state of the commute. So. Um, I'll start by highlighting a couple of the key findings here. Um, what we're reporting here in this visual is 
that we're seeing that highway uh, VMT in our region has gone up a little bit from 2021 to 2022, um, but has not yet hit its pre-pandemic uh, periods annually. And so you're going to hear me say that a lot because that's kind of the general theme of this report is that we are seeing movement back to pre-pandemic levels, but we're not quite there yet for most of the metrics. Um, we also report on highway travel times. We look at selected corridors in our region and we uh, measure exactly how long those trips take in PM and AM peak periods. And what we're seeing is that in 2022, the peak period travel times increased from 2021. Right. Um, moving on uh, to transit ridership, uh, what we're seeing here is we're seeing that transit ridership increased 49% uh, from 21 to 22. Um, and that is an average weekday transit ridership. And we're also reporting preliminary safety data. So in 2021 to 2022, uh, we're seeing a decrease of about 8% on the number of collisions on uh, reported to California Highway Patrol. Again, that's just provisional data and that may change once it becomes final. Um, diving into the report a little bit, uh, we do report on a couple of uh, region-wide measures um, that aren't specific to transit, just to give a little bit of context to uh, kind of the changes in not only the demographics, but the region as a whole. And so we report on population, employment, and uh, gross regional product. Uh, our population decreased slightly from 2021 to 2022. Uh, we report 2021 data for employment and uh, gross regional product because at the time this report was created, that was the most recent data that we have available. Um, but what we're seeing is that both employment and gross regional product increased from 2020 to 2021. So what we're reporting here is uh, when it comes to uh, travel times, as we mentioned before, we have 12 selected corridors um, and they're directional. So it's a total of 24 different measures that we're taking here. What this map allows you to do is it allows you to see exactly different corridors from different uh, commute uh, corridors and shows you exactly how long in minutes that each one of these trips takes. And so what I'll do is I'll just go ahead and hover over one of these points here. And what it'll show you here is exactly what the corridor's name is, what the direction it goes, and also shows you in minutes uh, how long the average travel time was during that peak period. And so generally speaking, what we saw across all of these corridors is that most of our corridors saw an increase in travel times. And what this also allows you to do is it also allows you to see for certain corridors that have corresponding transit trips, what the comparable transit trip uh, length would be in minutes. So in this instance, what we're seeing here is from Escondido to downtown, uh, a comparable trip along that same portion of that highway would be a, the 280 Rapid Express, which takes about 45 minutes. We also report on volume uh, on our highway system. And so what we're reporting here is uh, the 40 most uh, congested points on our highway locations in 2022. And what we're showing here is the AM and PM peak periods. And so uh, generally speaking across these points, we're seeing that the number of vehicles passing through these uh, congested areas increased, uh, generally speaking, from 2021 to 2022. Um, so as many of you know, safety is a uh, commitment in our regional plan that we focused on and what we're doing here in addition to some of our regional partners and Caltrans is uh, trying to provide data to be able to measure exactly how the conditions are changing on our highway system. And so what we're doing here is uh, reporting uh, collisions reported to CHP um, annually. And so what we're seeing, as I mentioned, in provisional data is that in 2022, the number of collisions uh, decreased slightly. Um, but again, I want to reiterate that once that data becomes final, that may change. Uh, moving on to transit, we do have quite a few measures um, and uh, what we're reporting here in this is just general average weekday transit ridership and this goes across both uh, NCTD and MTS uh, services, but uh, we've seen uh, transit ridership increase by 49%. Uh, um, a good uh, majority of that can be attributed to uh, the addition of the Midcoast Trolley Extension. Um, in addition, we're also seeing preliminary information coming from our Youth Opportunity Pass survey showing that youth ridership has increased due to the availability of tra uh, fare-free transit. Um, but then also just generally speaking across most of our routes, we're seeing increases uh, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, other than uh, a slight decrease in average weekday revenue miles uh, in 2021 to 2022, we're seeing that average weekday passenger miles and uh, passengers per revenue mile increased from 2021 to 2022 across our system. And then, as I mentioned, in addition to the uh, blue line extension, we're also seeing uh, increases across uh, all 10 of our most uh, busy transit routes. And so what this figure is showing you here is it's showing you across all different modes, the top 10 busiest transit routes. You can also filter this down by bus and rail, but just for the, uh, to spare a little bit of time, I'm not going to do that right now. 
uh, diving in a little bit further, uh, looking at rail ridership. Rail ridership is up across all of our different uh, rail routes. Um, the blue lines actually exceeded its pre-pandemic uh, uh, measures, uh, looking at the extension of the mid coast rail extension as the qualifying factor there. But then also we're seeing that we're increasing in our routes, but not quite there to pre-pandemic levels for the four other rail routes. Rapid ridership is up uh, on pretty much every metric that we uh, report in this uh, state of the commute report. Um, but again, still not quite yet at the pre-pandemic level. So what we report here is average weekday transit ridership for our rapids. Uh, we also report on passengers per uh, hour and then also average load factor. All of those have increased, but not are not quite yet at pre-pandemic levels. So we report on uh, specialized transportation. This was a request from ITOC that they wanted to see um, how uh, we are doing when it comes to the specialized transportation that Transnet funds. And so what we're looking at here is the senior mini grant program. And uh, this is really important as well as our region is starting to become older, this uh, type of specialized transportation. Uh, as you can see here, we're getting uh, more, de uh, more demand for it. So we have a number of uh, one-way passenger trips that's being reported in the blue. And then in the orange, we're seeing the invoice total here. Uh, both of those have increased in are the highest that we've reported in the past four years. We report on uh, two different bike measures. We report on bike lanes and we also report on bike counts. So what we're reporting here in this figure uh, is the number of bike lanes with the base year of 2010 and reporting the number of bike lanes by classification in 2022. Uh, new to this figure here, uh, for those of you who have seen this before, is the bike boulevards. Uh, in 2022, we completed 6.5 miles of bike boulevards for the first time. And so we, add, we added that section to the bottom of here, but we are seeing increases in all of the different classifications of bike lanes. Uh, in 2022 from 2021. And on that same note, uh, we, like, as I mentioned, we show bike counts, and this figure here is reporting by uh, eight different locations uh, that we measure bike activity in our region. We're showing that together that we are seeing a slight increase of about 4% in the number of bikes that we count at these locations. The colors coordinate to the location that the um, counts are coming from, but it's not quite yet at the 2020 bike boom that we saw. Uh, so seeing an increase, but not quite back to where we were at in 2020. Uh, new to this state of the community report, as Grace mentioned, we added two different measures that we've never reported on for this report, um, and this one being local uh, road traffic. And so there's two different measures that we're reporting here. It's speed and also average daily traffic. And so the colored coordinates are indicated by the uh, average speed during peak periods that are measured. Um, and so what this map's really cool allows you to do is it actually allows you to dive in to your local areas. And so this is measuring uh, conditions on uh, uh, major arterial roads in San Diego County. And so it allows users to really dive into the data and get to see exactly what their area looks like. And so that way it gets a little bit more personal. And so if you were to hover over any one of these lines, it'll tell you the direction, a lot of information about the road in addition to the uh, percent change year over year in speed and uh, annual average daily traffic. And then lastly, the last piece uh, that we are reporting on is reporting on the infrastructure conditions on our locally owned national highway system. Uh, and just to caveat, this is not the entire national highway system and this does not include local roads. Uh, and so what we're reporting here is that on locally owned uh, national highway system facilities that uh, that uh, when it comes to bridge conditions and pavement conditions, 82% of bridges and 85% of pavement conditions were uh, rated as either good or fair in our region. And so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it back to Grace Munoz. There we go. All right, so next steps for the 2023 State of the Commute. We're gonna have a public release of the safety dashboard with additional enhancements. We're gonna to continue to work on bridge and pavement interim dashboards that are still in process. Um, we're, we have started a Caltrans planning grant to modernize our automated passenger counter software and develop a ridership dashboard. Uh, we're gonna gather more bike data funded through the Transnet Smart Growth Incentive and Active Transportation Grants. And we're gonna have future iterations of this dashboard and we're gonna compare it to how the region is doing Going back to 2005. And so that concludes our presentation. And I'm happy to, we're happy to answer any questions that um, any of the members might have. Uh, we have some additional comments from Colleen. Yes, thank you, both Grace and Connor. And just 
For the committee's benefit here, um, we're super fortunate at Sandag to have incredible data scientists like we have here. Connor is one of the newer additions to our team. I think this is the first time we've made a presentation to a policy committee or a board, and I think you did it with Grace, and that was fantastic. And I know Grace has been around a while, but both of you just being able to, you know, pull all this information together. One of the things they pointed out that I wanted to make sure the committee was aware of is the open data Portal. And so this is the first time we've done this required state of the commute report using the data in our open data portal. And that is actually an award winning national award winning data portal. And the importance of that is that we're using consistent data across the board for everything that we do. And then that data gets pulled into these different reports, whether it's the state of the commute or any of the other reports that are there. So um, thank you so much to the team. And I, what I'm loving about today's meeting is that you're getting to see some of our Sandag superstars, you know, presenting information to you all. So I know they're ready and willing to answer any questions about this particular report and if other data questions come up too, we welcome that. So I'll turn it back to the chair. Thank you, Colleen. Uh, let's go to public comments uh, and then we'll come back to for board comments and questions. Uh, Francesca, any public comments? Thank you, Chair. We have one public comment, the original draw. You can go ahead. You know, the reason why you guys do these reports, it's not really about like commuting and seeing, you know, making that better it's more about keeping people from traveling and you guys have said it before it's not about going to electric vehicles we got to quit get people to stop driving and so you use these reports in order to get us into that um to less to be in commute less and to be in um you know densely populated areas where we don't have to travel um and it's sad because we're using you know money that the people who drive pay um taxes into um helping the roads and really you're just using that to um make bike lanes and other transit more possible all while you are you know keep taking away parking spots and reducing lanes and you know not really fixing freeways so it's it's not about um you know keeping people in a com like commuting it's about keeping us from doing that and that's what's so sad is that um, most people don't see that. You guys have a plan to, you know, basically keep people in a 15 minute city. You may not be calling it that yet, but that is your goal. And, um, you know, we shouldn't be talking about how we can, you know, make things better when we take money from one thing and put it into something else to basically de-incentivize people from driving. Um, and, and we're funding all of this infrastructure um at the sake of our own uh and so it's just really sad because everything gets you know muddied all the things get blurry together and it seems like what you guys are doing is really great but it's all about you know making people constricted in their movement and you know for some, anybody that doesn't see that as terrifying i mean they already have 15 minute cities going on elsewhere and we're headed there very very quickly the more you talk about how much people are driving and you know starting to charge people for the hours or whatever it is <clears throat> it's all in purpose and it's intentional to you know keep people from being at free that concludes the public comments on this item thank you actually before i went go for uh, questions and um discussion by the board uh, committee members i was just wondering if ann and, and um uh, transit operators, both uh, both of you, Chris, and uh, certainly if you want to make any other comments, that's a major part of this this the data that came in from your organizations. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I'll, I'll add a, a little bit to that too. You know, as the as the data is um, reported, and and I think this is a, a great tool and and dashboard for us to reference, certainly. Um, but we do switch back and forth sometimes between. Um, uh, a more comprehensive data or data that's that's um, coming from from Caltrans or those that data that's that's those data sets that are specific to um, our our highways and and interstates that that Caltrans operates maintains etc. Um, and then there's other portions of the data that's shared is more specific to our our local roads and jurisdictions. So sometimes, you know, maybe um, just a, a point of comment or clarification, if we can 
still somehow um, kind of better show that information or or context, I guess, contextualize some of that information on there. And I'll and I'll just use the example when we talk about our infrastructure um, conditions there. So the information um, presented in the dashboard is um, specific to those locally owned roads. So um, as we, well, actually roads and, and bridges. So when we look at the um, state's component of those, those highways and um, that um, Caltrans is responsible for maintaining, we do have the, the broader um, um, re requirements or, or qualifications that are coming in through SB1 um, dollars and through our shop program to maintain. So our our percentages or our numbers are are a little bit um, different um, there, and it could be helpful potentially to to show the them them both. Um, in there, just so we have kind of that that running metric of of where we at, where we're at, and where we're progressing um, through those. But um, I, you know, the, the information is is there and transparent, and and you know the sources are are shown. So we certainly appreciate that utilizing that same information and and sharing. But just wanted to just clarify a little bit that um, for those maybe initially looking at it that it. It could be just representing different jurisdictions there. Okay, thank you. Let's go on to uh, committee members. Uh, Epson, I think you may have been first, and then Mayor Prince. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Um, <laughs> I think that this is great. The dashboard is great, and um, it gives you know kind of basic numbers for for transit increase in, in ridership. Um, but I, I just wanted to fill that in a little bit from um, the NCTD side. So uh, there has been quite a post COVID shift as we're all aware, um, certainly on the coaster. Uh, where we've gone from what was mostly a commuter rail line to being embraced for more um, leisure activities by folks, which is great. Um, the coaster tw for 21-22, coaster weekend ridership has increased by 154.7%. That's huge. Um, and um, we're also working to bring back commuter rail at the same time. So, um, you know, to stimulate coaster commuter rail ridership. And in response to that COVID shift, um, we, we at NCTD launched a fair product targeting hybrid workers. And I think uh, you may remember me talking about this in the past or announcing it, the five or 10 pack coaster round trip tickets are, are up to 50% off. So, you know, we're doing everything that we can to continue to get people um, to use the public transportation that we have. Thanks. Thank you. Um, appreciate the report and love, uh, although I acknowledge my math is not my best subject, I do know how to add and subtract and multiply and divide. And therefore, I love data um, because it also gives us the ability to make decisions based upon empirical evidence instead of anecdotal. So thank you for putting this dashboard together. I've I've scanned the QR code and and playing with it here on my iPad. It's it's really uh, great to be able to look at it in this way. I also would point out that uh, we prepare this state of the commute report not for some nefarious reason, but because it's mandated by the Transnet Ordinance. And it says on an annual basis, review ongoing Sandag system performance evaluation, including Sandag state of the commute report provide an independent analysis of information included in that report. So thank you. Um, I would point out graphically that having the arrows all the same color is not very helpful. It, it, it would be better maybe to change the color, not to editorialize too much, but I know that peak period highway travel increased is not necessarily good. Um, transit ridership increase is good, in my opinion, right? And I think as a transit agency, as an agency that is dedicated to that, it, we should perhaps label that as good. Traffic volumes increased at 28 of the 40 most congested highway locations going up is 
probably should be red arrow because that's not good. Um, same with highway travel times increased on 19 of 24 major commute corridors that are monitored. That's That should be a red arrow. 4% bike activity across eight bike routes increased by 4%. That's green, maybe a light green. We want more. Um, and so, you know, I appreciate this. If you go to the dashboard, that 49% transit rider increase, increased. Um, it would be interesting to have the context of that 49%, um, but you can get more information. And I think modes are important. And so uh, looking at the dashboard, I can, I can pick through that a little bit. Um, and once again, the other thing that's very important to me when I look at the graph on the dashboard about bike ridership, total bike counts, there's a, a section of the bar graph that says coast highway and coastal rail trail. But because both of those are quite linear and, and go from North County uh, to San Diego, it would be better to be able to drill down a little deeper to see, for example, by jurisdiction, that would be helpful because I think a lot of the people in our jurisdiction are interested in knowing the benefits of the uh, resources that we are investing in uh, bike infrastructure. And so the ability to uh, more specifically identify mode shift is really important. So we are a bedroom community for the most part and therefore people who live in Encinitas travel somewhere for their job. And we would like to be able to identify the modes by which most people are traveling. Obviously, most people are traveling by car. Um, that's why we advocate for an improved transit system so that the option to take transit is there. That's why we're making improvements on bike infrastructure so that the option to ride a bike is there. So um, in some cases, there'll be bike and transit. Um, so, you know, these are all, um, uh, very important metrics for us to be able to um, make use of. So anything you could do to make it handier in that regard would be really very much appreciated. And then finally, um, you know, how are we counting this? Is it we go out and, you know, uh, count manually uh, for a day or an hour or a week? I know that freeway traffic is... Uh, pretty uh, sophisticated in counts, but um, I know our bike trails don't have any mechanical counting ability. So somebody's coming to answer that question. Thank you, appreciate the effort. Ah, I heard my name. Hi, I'm Josh Clark. I uh, do, I run the counting program for bikes and peds here at Sandag, and it's as sophisticated as the inductive loop freeway counting technology. It's the same thing fixed inductive loop counters at, at fixed locations. So the Coast Highway location that you're interested in is actually in the city of Solana Beach uh, on 101, just south of Loma Santa Fe Drive. And yep, it uses the same, uh, picks up the metallic signature of a bike, but uh, not a car. Okay, thanks. Uh, and thanks for the presentation again, and thanks for all the work that you guys have done. As Colleen mentioned, it's pretty amazing, and uh, looking forward to getting even better, get too much more capability in there. I might be able to give up my Netflix subscription, and I'll just be busy playing with this data. But um, this may be a little bit um, uh, focused and... And, uh, and you know, it's it's just related to my my personal passion to some degree, which is that, uh, you know, this is a lot of data and a lot of information. And, you know, we all we have a, several priorities. Um, but what you choose to put up top and front is going to be into, you know, it's basically telling you telling us what our priorities are, because that's going to be what's top of mind. And I noticed that on this uh, on the flyer here on the sheet and the first four buckets that you have on the dashboard, um, there's discussion around collisions, but um, we are, uh, you know, working and want to be a vision zero organization. I think we need to have information about bike ped accident rates in those top areas, just so we can say, yes, so we have every touch point that we have where we're showing this type of information. We can say, are we making progress on our vision zero effort? And, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not going to suggest how, but I, I don't want to ruin your pretty bubble st structure here, but, you know, if there's a way to also include specifics about 
where we are on bike and peg collision rates at the top level so we can say are we making progress in this and making people feel that it's safe to take these other roads of transportation thanks sure let's hear from mts yeah thank you um i really like this dashboard it's great um the one thing that i do want to um, piggyback on is a comment by chair uh, edson it, as it relates to people using transit for other trips other than commuting. And I have to talk about the fact that today is Comic-Con and opening day at the Del Mar racetrack. Um, big day for transit. Um, we had our second highest ridership today, or sorry, yesterday, since Comic-Con 2019. So that just tells you um, transit is an important part of the economics in San Diego region. Um, very much so for these special events. And the fact that that brings and generates so much tourism, um, you know, uh, arts, uh, being able to get people who normally don't get to access these events um, to these events. Um, I can look and cite in the Union Tribune this morning, there's a letter to the editor talking about how great uh, the trolley did in clearing out the U.S. Panama soccer game um, at the end of the event. Um, and you, I could show pictures of the parking lot still full and the platform was empty. So it's just really important to our region. And I want to heighten the fact that while data sets are great and we run our business on those data sets, it also doesn't really speak to all the great things that these various modes do. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just add to that. Um, as you can imagine, as uh, we get asked about ridership a lot. In fact, um, my mom has stopped asking me about my kids. She now says, how's coaster ridership, right? So we, we get this all the time. And it, it is really hard to sort of explain what our industry has gone through. Uh, the, the most labored analogy I can come up with is, you know, we were hit by an asteroid with COVID uh, and now we're rebuilding, right? And so that life coming back doesn't happen automatically. It's going to take time. Uh, the other thing about it is it is not going to look like it did before the asteroid, right? It's going to look differently. Uh, and I think what, what Sharon's describing, what Chair Edson touched on is that it's starting to look different, but good, right? So we're seeing that leadership or uh, leisure rider come back. Uh, our weekday average now on a Padre game day is up 50% from a non-game day. So you see how much that contributes in a non-commuter way. So commuters are still very much an important market segment for us, but they're one market segment. There's, there's a vast group of other market segments that we're talking about that are ways of growing ridership. And we think about this now, not just as riders, but as trips. We're, ne we're never gonna capture 100% of a person's trips, but the more percentage of trips that we can capture, the better off we are. That's the point behind the five and 10 pack uh, that Chair Edson referred to. Um, we can't get five days a week from a hybrid commuter because they don't go in five days a week. They go in some other number. So we're trying to figure out how can we capture the greatest number of days that they do. Um, we're seeing really great results from that product so far. 40% um, up from when we the first full month to June, 40% increase on the sales of that product. So we're hopeful. Um, so there's really good signs. Um, I would just say for this committee and for the um, uh, Sandag as, as a whole, just the way we look at this is not, um, you know, where are we compared to pre? It's are we making sustained real growth each each period? And I can tell you that we absolutely are. Uh, and they're not small levels of growth, they're big levels of growth. And we see it in our system. I know MTS sees it on their system. So, you know, as we look at this data, we just have to have the perspective that, um, you know, mm -hmm. This isn't a dead cap bounce, meaning the, the, the increases you're seeing aren't going to drop back down. We're going to build on them year after year. So I think that's a, a good way to look at our, our ridership numbers. Thank you. Raphael. Yeah, so the question I had was just, it, it's great looking through the, the data and the charts. Um, and I think the theme has been pre-COVID, post-COVID. Some of the charts have that 10-year snapshot, but some only have three. So it, cuts off that 2019 year and it's hard to see kind of where it rebounded from. So I'm just wondering, like I'm looking here and it's got, you know, the peak period is 10 years, but then uh, on the right side, it, it only shows three. Is, is that fourth year missing for a reason or? So we tried to find a good balance of uh, being able to report 
as much information as possible. And so in certain instances, we have a limited amount of information. And so we're reporting everything that we have. Uh, and then for others, we're reporting all of the information, just given the amount of space that we have, because there's kind of a balance you want to be able to draw between making it overwhelming for the user while also making sure that you're adding kind of like you're mentioning that, like that context of the trend line. And so, um, and that's one feedback that we've also received as well. And so as we reiterate this dashboard in uh, next year, we're all going to be continuing to find ways to add as much context to each one of those fingers as possible. So um, in certain instances, it's just the, that's how much information we had available. And then there's other instances where um, it was a more of an editorial decision to make. Yeah, I would just give a comment that if it was only the 2019 year that was added to instead of the full 10, it would still provide a lot of that context. Thank you. Any additional comments or questions from any commissioners? I'd like, thank you, Chris and Sharon, for your, your comments. Um, since I'm a transit advocate, uh, your comments are actually going to follow mine pretty well, uh, which is I appreciate the, this report a lot. Um, and I, I think what's to me important is this data is so important towards our um, improvements to our community uh, with regards to health reducing health impacts from our transportation system, uh, addressing uh, economic issues, whether it's increasing our economic uh, strength by having these these systems uh, like Comic Con and special events uh, occur and making it easy for people to attend. My trolley ride uh, to downtown today was a little bit fuller and my guess was by the look of uh, the others uh, joining me on the trolley that, and, and where they got off, they were going to Comic Con. Um, so I think um, we we need this data, and I hope we use this data uh, to help us address economic issues, um, health uh, disparities in our community, health impacts, um, and how we can improve them. You know, the community who uses the trolley ultimately is spending a lot less money than the person who's, who's driving, and, and so we need to take note of that, the same with the bicyclists. Uh, so uh, I think that's the next step that we can take from this is um, the, the benefits uh, of making these shifts in, in mode share. And and which comes to then, I know what Sharon was driving at, uh, which is we need to fund transit and we need to find ways to fund transit to make that work if we're going to really expand these numbers significantly, both in infrastructure and operations. So so uh, thank you for, for making a comment, Sharon and Chris. Um, uh, because we want to move on along those paths uh, in that direction. Um, anything else? This is a great information piece. Um, and, uh, you know, my, my wife, um, is, is, she's a retired librarian now. She has a thing called uh, no screen time or less screen time. So this is not going to help me in that regard. <laughs> All right. Uh, anything else? If not, we can go on to... Uh, Item 11, um, Susan will uh, present a overview of the regional zero emissions vehicle strategy. It would help if I turn this on, here we are. Good morning, everybody. Uh, happy to be here today. My name is Susan Friedman, and I manage the climate section in the planning department uh, for SANDAG. And I'm pleased to be with you to talk a bit about the a regional zero emission vehicle strategy that's being developed by a collaboration that SANDAG is a part of called Accelerate to Zero Emissions. And this effort was included as one of the near-term actions in our 2021 regional plan under the policies and programs for low carbon transportation solutions. So I'm gonna give some background about the collaboration for folks that aren't familiar with it, an overview of the strategy report, and then take a closer look at some of the strategies and tactics to implement them and hear any feedback you may have and uh, share some next steps on the project. 
So first, the idea of Accelerate to Zero Emissions collaboration, it came from um, several meetings back in 2020 with the Air Pollution Control District, uh, SANDAG, the County of San Diego, the City of San Diego, and SDG&E. We were really looking at, everyone was pursuing different um, clean transportation programs or plans. We thought, you know, we could do a lot more if we came together and also worked in a coordinated fashion. So in addition to what we do individually, we wanted to come together and create a strategy and an approach for the region um, as well. So uh, from there, from the core project team of those five, we then also formed a steering committee with sub-regional representation from the local governments, as well as from academia, uh, two equity-focused organizations, uh, as well as a business association. And I'll say one third group we also did is we formed an advisory group of folks, which has had involvement from most of the local government staff, as well as from community-based organizations, labor, universities, community colleges, uh, industry, and the general public. So we have four main objectives of this collaboration of A to Z. The first was to develop a regional gap analysis, really to see where the region was at in 2020 and where we thought we needed to be in 2030. Uh, next is what we're on right now, developing a regional strategy for how do we meet those gaps. Uh, the third thing is to increase the resources coming into the region from federal and state funding sources, as well as foundations, uh, by showing a collaborative effort. And the last one is then to serve going forward as a forum to inform stakeholders about ZEV efforts, funding opportunities, and, and what folks can do either in their local jurisdictions or at their organizations. So this was the, the first product, the regional gap analysis. Uh, and uh, many of you have seen a cleaner, or a jazzier version of this slide and some of the um, past presentations that we've done on our blueprint grant that we're working on at SANDAG. Uh, but really this came out in 2021 and we saw that uh, we expect that from 2020 where we had about 70,000 zero emission vehicles in the county, we're expecting about 770,000 by 2030, and we're actually looking like we're going to be on pace to make that number. Uh, today in the county, there's 95,000 zero emission vehicles registered, uh, and that's passenger vehicles as well as trucks and buses. Uh, and, but what we did also see is that there's a need for a lot more infrastructure to keep up with what that demand is. And this forecast came about, it was with a consultant's help, but it was really looking at both state policies and regulations as well as market trends. So this is the heart of what we're chatting about today is with the ZEV strategy and the project. Uh, do our typical review of existing conditions and whatnot, uh, but to develop the strategy, we really came, we decided to do a lot of engagement early on at community level, uh, really to hear from folks, what do they see as opportunities, what do they like about EVs, what are challenges, what are things they don't like, uh, and to get that kind of input early on. Uh, and then there was the development of core principles as well as the strategies and then tactics for the strategies. And with consultant support, we are able to do this. And then by uh, then getting feedback from uh, community events as well as from our stakeholder groups, the steering committee and advisory. And then A to Z, we plan to have a final strategy available this September, and it's gonna be shared uh, during the National EV Day that'll be here in San Diego in October. Details to come probably in another month, uh, but it's planned to be at Snapdragon Stadium. So I, I do like to highlight this. Before coming up with uh, the 10 strategies, we set about having some core principles or foundational principles for what we were going to do. And this is for the decision making. And it really follows the state's lead. Uh, the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development, or GOBIS, up at the state, they led all of the state agencies in developing a California market, ZEBS market strategy. And they pretty much have these principles principles. We, we vetted these with everybody. We thought they made a lot of sense to just bring this straight into our regional strategy. Uh, and they are um, inco incorporating equity in every decision. 
Uh, that is first and foremost, hearing from what the issues are, considerations in local communities, as well as directing planning and programs that prioritize um, communities that are most impacted by air pollution and other things, as well as embracing all ZEV pathways. This means both like the plug-in electric vehicles, as well as uh, fuel cell vehicles that are uh, powered by hydrogen, but not just that, looking at pathways for used vehicles, new vehicles, for cars, for trucks, for buses, for e-bikes, for neighborhood electric vehicles that Colleen mentioned in her report out earlier. Uh, collective problem solving, let's not work in silos, let's talk to folks that are in the know, like uh, different nonprofits, other stakeholders, colleges and universities, uh, and then make, come up with our planning. Uh, it, then public complementing private, we have a lot of public regulations or goal setting that then spurs on um, market development and innovation, which can then get us the even bolder goals for going to zero and decarbonization. Uh, and finally, designing for resilience and adaptation is really making sure when we're getting a lot more infrastructure in that's going to power zero emission transportation, uh, that we're looking at renewable options, we're looking at storage options that enable um, the infrastructure to fun function, you know, better, uh, as well as cheaper uh, when it comes to rates and, uh, and time of day use. So... Here are the 10 strategies. And we de developed these through a combination of steps. We did some an analysis of regulatory conditions, of best practices from other regional and state plans that are happening, uh, engagement with the public, and then also some modeling that was done through the consultant on the impacts of the strategies. Uh, and these range from increasing the percentage of zero emission v VMT, you know, which is reducing pl more polluting vehicles, uh, having equitable ZEV infrastructure in the region, supporting workforce development, uh, encouraging and supporting fleet transitions, and supporting innovative projects as well that can really move the dial. On the next two slides, I'm going to share some of the strategies, go a little deeper, and some of the sample tactics for those. Uh, so I'm just kind of highlighting here, but we can come back to these if folks like at the end. So right here on, on this slide and the next one, the top half of the screen lists the strategy and then the bottom half under the arrow are some of the tactics to implement them. Um, and then many of the tactics you'll see, you know, they can apply to multiple strategies. Nothing is in just um, one silo. Everything's very interactive, I would say. And the tactics when we have the report ready, when A to Z publishes this, um, they'll be recommended for implementation, whether it'll say if this is good at the regional level, this is good for a local jurisdiction, this is good at a community level, or this is good for industry to lead. So taking a look at a couple of these, uh, increasing the percentage of zero emission VMT, a uh, ways to get to make this happen and accelerate that is providing rebates and incentives. That's something that we're working on right now is developing a vehicle incentive program at Sandag. We have a Caltrans planning grant to figure that out. Uh, and then here locally, the Air Pollution Control District also has a Clean Cars for All program that's opening up that's going to retire more polluting vehicles and then also incentivize the purchase of either a new zero emission vehicle or an e-bike or even a, um, have availability of transit passes and things like that. And then this also will focus on uh, the truck and bus transition as well and finding ways to support that and incentivize that. In terms of strategy two, as I feel like very close with that, with the equitable siting of ZEV infrastructure, it's while we're directing incentives or we create these incentive programs, we want to direct a lot of incentive dollars into communities of concern, into areas that are facing the most pollution burdens. Uh, and that's something that we've been doing with our existing charger rebate program for the last few years with the California Energy Commission and the Air District. And it's also something that we've seen from SDG&E and some of the federal programs that will be coming out soon. Similarly, we want to use equity metrics when we're um, as a guide in our ZEV planning. And this is, again, in the design of programs, but also then with seeing and performance monitoring. What are the results? Are we getting the impact we need? Do we need to um, put more resources? Is it more outreach? Is it more tools? Um, are there other barriers that we're not, you know, that we were not aware of? 
Uh, in terms of workforce development with, with strategy four, uh, this, I feel, is a little earlier on, with the exception of one great training program uh, that the labor unions have been really pushing forward, and they're part of our state and our local programs uh, for um, training electricians on EV charging infrastructure. We need to get more of these programs for, you know, maintenance of the vehicles, and community colleges are really leading this effort, um, and we want to be working with them and supporting that and getting information out to our communities on where there's opportunities for new career areas. Uh, so these next strategies, and I'll just say I picked these I, six out of 10. One, because I figured you guys might fall asleep a little bit if I went through 10 strategies. But also uh, from our engagement, these were the most popular ones that we heard about when we were um, talking to staff and community folks. So in terms of the number seven, uh, which is for supporting more infrastructure and multifamily residences, I put up there a couple that are tactics that are very local government focused, which is improving permit processes that enable more EV charging. There are a couple state laws that are in place to, for local governments to streamline permits. Um, we've got more than half of the local governments here in the region are already doing that, and another big chunk are on their way to getting that done. So there's a little more we can be doing there, uh, as well as coordination, kind of peer-to-peer -peer learning across governments. We've held some webinars in this area uh, to enable folks to streamline more of the permitting process. Uh, in terms of number nine, this was very popular with your fleet directors, uh, but encouraging and supporting the transition to zero emission fleets. A uh, big tactic that's happening around the region right now is developing fleet transition plans. And it's really how, uh, based on when you're replacing vehicles, you know, how do you start integrating in, whether it's um, electric cars, or if you have trucks or um, shuttle buses or things like that, figuring out the timing and evaluating the type of infrastructure you need. And we've got some tools out there that can help support that. Uh, and then finally, with strategy 10, this was about supporting innovation and identifying key innovative partnerships and pilots, um, leveraging new sources of funding and collaborating together. Um, one that sandag has been looking at and has a grant submission into the California Energy Commission right now on is uh, to pilot a wireless charging concept. Uh, and this is looking at it with a transit route. Uh, we're looking at other opportunities with that as well. Um, but there's lots of innovative things happening in the region that can also move the dial, dial for when everything's electric that needs to be motorized. So in terms of uh, the next steps, we're going to, uh, the core team members, so county staff, the APCD and others are gaining feedback on these concepts and principles um, from their stakeholders. We'd like to continue getting feedback through the end of this month. Uh, if anybody has feedback in addition today, they could email to us. We do expect a final strategy to be available from A to Z in um, probably mid to late September. Uh, and then after the strategy is completed, uh, we're planning to do some outreach out to local government staff and other agency staff and stakeholders with, hey, so there's this report, but this is how some of these tactics can help you at your organization and make this something that can really get used and have some legs. So with that, that concludes. That concludes my presentation, but I'm happy to answer any questions, take feedback, um, really hear from you. Let's go ahead and have a public comment first, so then we can move right along. Uh, Francesca, do we have any public comments? Thank you, Chair. We have two public commenters on this item. The original draw will be first, who will be followed by Christina Marquez. So no wonder why SDG and E is one of your core partners, because they have so much to gain in this pursuit to go all electric um, as they raise the prices on the people who can barely afford to just use any kind of electricity. Now you're putting more down the pipe to make them have to pay for more and more. Um, and you claim that you are you know, creating jobs, but you're also taking jobs away from the people who have for decades um, you know, been working on gas vehicles and other types of um, infrastructure. And what I don't understand is you guys are um, blatantly ignoring the fact that these EV um, 
you know, charging stations and or vehicles are not what's better for the environment or the people. You sit here and say that you're concerned with, you know, gas vehicles and the pollution and all of these things um, and how it affects the environment and people. But we don't get down to the fact that what you're pushing right now is deadly to people like the more radiation that you guys add by adding all of these um, charging stations and vehicles that are emitting this it is going to be de te like catastrophic to the community because more and more people are going to get sick and they can put it under the guise of another pandemic but when people are getting immense amounts of radiation that are is already happening now but is going to be even increased in the future with your plans here. Um, it is completely negligent for you not to look into that and blatantly ignore it. Um, you should be doing your job and making sure that none of this has any kind of results that would be detrimental to anybody or the environment. And you're not doing that. You're just claiming that there, this is the way to go. We need to do it. But you're never bringing in the health impacts of that. So you need to do that with the lithium batteries and these charging stations. I mean, even all of the other things are toxic as well. I think your next speaker will be Christina Marquez. You can go ahead. Good morning, and thank you very much. Christina Marquez speaking on behalf of IBEW Local 569 and 3,600 power professionals and union electricians in San Diego and Imperial counties. First off, I just wanted to say great report. Thank you very much. Um, very informational. And uh, Ms. Friedman, I know that you care, and we thank you for that. Um, so as an electrician myself uh, and going through the apprenticeship, knowing that I was going to be able to get uh, certifications, especially EVITP, Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Training Program, and being able to help reduce greenhouse gas emissions by uh, in, uh, installing charging stations and uh, building the infrastructure means so much to me and many of the other electricians. It's because we have over 700 EVITP certified electricians in San Diego and Imperial counties alone. We're ready to do the work. We're ready to bring this forward. Along with not just EV charging stations, we want to help build public transportation and mass transit out as well. It needs to happen simultaneously, everything. Um, also to Audra, so SDG&E also has a lot to lose if you think about it. Gas, they're not going to be producing gas. They know the importance of reducing GHGs and having uh, the electrical industry expand is a uh, clean energy that is necessary. Thank you, everyone. Have a great Friday. That concludes the public comments. Thank you. Do we have any uh, comments or questions and discussion items from the committee? Sandy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you. That was a great report and thank you uh, for the presentation. Uh, so just a question I have, it's mainly on the local level uh, coordination. Can you share what are the other local level perspectives besides permitting for policy recommendations to support the regional ZEV strategy? And if so, what other incentives to bring in for the other jurisdictions? And if that could be included in, in the report. So the report that's hyperlinked in the staff report shows how the different you know, jurisdictions have climate action plans and they're calling out reducing, you know, GHG by certain time certain, but can that also include like specific ways and how it could support the regional ZEV strategy? Sure, and, and just to clarify, yeah, the report that's linked in there was the gap analysis that we did first, and it did lay out all the barriers, which then was the jumping point for this SEV strategy. The consultant does not have the a working draft that looks that looks good enough to be able to put out yet. Um, so I'm speaking to, to the draft, but yes, uh, the strategy is gonna be looking at, um, like for the port, for instance, calling out marine clean air strategy and, and fleet transition planning and how 
um, working with, say, coordination with Caltrans and Sandag and others can help support some of the truck charging and focusing on working with the community groups and through AB 617, which is, I think, a process every most people here know about, but the impacted port side communities, and now there's a new one at the border communities. So it does make these linkages with, with how to coordinate, but but then, um, since this is just a snapshot in time in the report, it's really this continuation of having e A to Z meetings and port staff have been participating um, that we want to see, hey, how do we implement this, you know, today? And as all these new funding sources come out federally and at the state, what can we take advantage of to work together to get more stuff done here? Thank you. Um, and then just a, a follow-up question to that, uh, also would like to elevate the city of National City, so we have the port, Sandag, and also the city of National City with the EV charging. So I want I know that in that that gap analysis, it showed that National City has the 2011 Climate Action Plan, which I believe they need, needs to be updated. Uh, my council members not here to defend it, but but I'm just curious to see as you're having these workshops and discussion if we can like elevate that because as you're aware of the maritime clean air strategy at the port side, we're calling Zeb trucks, you know. We have an RFP charging infrastructure, but I wanted to see if we can elevate that and, you know, build that from that synergy. Yes, we can do that. And I'm going to just mention one other um, effort that's happening that will also complement this is that um, through the Environmental Protection Agency, um, they've given out, or it's not awarded yet, but the non-competitive $1 million planning grants uh, to the top 67 metro population-wise, top 67 metropolitan regions in the country. And so Sandag is leading that effort with your local governments, and we're going to be coming to a future meeting about that. Um, but there's going to be uh, almost $5 billion federally nationwide worth of implementation dollars tied to implementing climate action plan near-term measures. So that can include clean transportation side as well as buildings and other things. So it's something that we're also going to be coordinating both of those efforts on so that we can, yeah, move the dial here and, and with the local cities. Great. And just one last question, and this is from the comment made by Ms. Marquez from IBW569. At the Port of San Diego, we, an administrative level, we've uh, adopted EVITP. And so I I'm curious about how does that work on this side on Sandag? We also adopted the use of uh, having this certification for electricians, licensed electricians, if they're putting an EV infrastructure that's funded um, through the Sandag charger rebate program, which is partnered with the state and the air district. Uh, and then we also pushed out training on EVITP to electricians across the region on that. So um, I feel like there's a lot of others that are the leaders in this area, and we're trying to do what we can to support that effort. Uh, but where we want to see is how can we do more to support even the training for, you know, on vehicles, um, which is an area we're learning more right now about. Uh, and actually, our blueprint plan that's looking at trucks and buses that you heard about last meeting, um, that's one of those that we're going to do a dive in on, on workforce in that front. Thank you. That's the end of my questions. Supervisor uh, Joe Anderson. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. I uh, appreciate the report and appreciate your hard work on this. Uh, some of the issues that uh, I've encountered is sometimes our incentives aren't always correct. And I know this isn't at your level, but as you're moving forward, think about this. Across the street from Parkway Plaza, there are four parking spots with eight charging stations. I don't know how that works. Only four cars can get there. Uh, yet there's eight charging stations. So clearly it was incentivized that people got credit for eight with only four parking spaces. But it, it's embarrassing. The second um, uh, issue I have is, as we're looking at all the housing density bonuses that we receive, many of them are based on being located close to mass transit. So as we're moving forward and we're prioritizing based on equity, these people, by definition, shouldn't have cards. There's no parking for them. Uh, they're uh, getting these high-density bonuses because they're so close to mass transit. These are people that should be using mass transit, yet we know that one-sixth of our population, the unincorporated, has very little infrastructure and very little, in fact, next to none, mass transit. So when we're thinking about that equity lens, 
let's remember that we have to finish the race with everybody crossing the finish line, not just the coastal people, but the people living inland uh, who rely on it. Many of those people in my district are uh, blue collar workers. They, uh, by the definition of their job, change locations on a fairly regular basis. And as a result, mass transit may not be the best answer for them, but having uh, an electric truck, as we know that, you know, Ford 150, the lightning's out, Dodge is producing one, there's more trucks coming, the prices are coming down. There's a good likelihood that if we had a strong network uh, that electric trucks could really be optimized in my district. So I, I just want you to think about some of these things. I think so often, once you leave El Cajon, you forget there's 500,000 people living east of there in the, in the more rural portion. So when I say rural, when you think in terms of Lakeside, it's what, 54,000 residents. When you're looking in terms of Ramona, again, you have a large population. On this board, there are six cities that are smaller than the community of Lakeside. So uh, I just think that as we're very city center focused, we should also be thinking about the unincorporated. But thank you for that report. Oh, Mayor Kranz and Duncan. Yes, great report. Um, I, several years ago, had an e-golf and learned what uh, the, the real impacts of range anxiety can do to one's mental health. Um, I look at this report um, on the gap analysis and I see on the cover you got um, some nice graphics. Uh, and I, I would say that those folks that have just one bar of power left and they're driving down the freeway, they are in their car, the AC is off, they're sweating, wondering, can they make it to their destination? Yes. And so, you know, some thoughts, uh, I do believe that there was talk about being able to put uh, elect electrify the roadbed so that future technology might allow the charging of cars as they are being driven. I hope that we're thinking about that or looking at that. Um, I wonder if Caltrans would think about putting charging stations at on and off ramps that would allow people that were limping along to get off the freeway and, and put a splash like they do at the Indy 500, you know, for those last few laps um, so that people can get home. Uh, Encinitas installed a charging station at our city hall, and it's pretty fascinating to see who um, who comes to that. There are people that are in that mode where they had no more juice. Um, some of the some of those chargers are fast chargers, so it has become quite popular. We are very fortunate to have Tesla that is locating, uh, taking a BMW dealership and and converting it to a Tesla dealership. Um, so pleased with that. Um, the other thing is that when I had my e-golf, my problem was I was commuting to Rancho Bernardo and um, my, my, the office that I worked at didn't have any charging facilities and there were none in the near the neighborhood that would allow me to drive my car over there, plug it in, go to the office, and then you know three hours later go back and get my car. And so the focus on these C, you know, these parking lots, large parking lots throughout the region, um, I think is key to um, seeing uh, the adoption of ZEVs. Um, this notion that they need to be in these uh, communities of, you know, what what is the. Anyhow, Some communities of concern. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, the, the idea that we need public charging stations there isn't nearly as true as the fact that we need to make sure that when we incentivize the purchase of an electric vehicle, that we also include the charging um, devices that would go in their homes because that's the way it needs to be done. You don't drive to the charging station. It's not convenient if it's not at your home. So charging at night and then at the place of work, having charging facilities is, is really very important. And then finally, yesterday while I was down here for the board meeting, um, I uh, ran across a board member um, who I won't name, uh, who was had brought his electric bike battery up and charged it while we were at the meeting so that he could make his ride back to Solana Beach after the meeting. And, um, 
it seems to me that we would want to have better facilities for charging bikes. And I know there are some limitations on that because of the fact that bike batteries aren't conveniently charged. They are also an overnight charging six hours, whatever. Um, but maybe the region could drive a little different technology for bike batteries. So um, hopefully that's part of the conversation as well. And um, I'm glad we're diving into this. And I would say that uh, in spite of the fact that lithium batteries and some of the other technology that goes with this isn't, doesn't have uh, zero impacts on our environment, our goal is to reduce greenhouse gases. And so um, this is an important uh, transition to these zero uh, emissions vehicles. So thank you for the report and for the work that you're doing. Thank you, Mayor Kranz. Councilman Duncan. Just a brief follow on comment to Mayor Kranz's comments. The one thing I would ask that you hopefully consider or, or think about is that a lot of the people that live in those disadvantaged communities or communities of concern and some of the more heavily impacted polluted communities work elsewhere. So for me, the ability to charge in the areas where they work is extremely important because as Mayor Kranz was also saying, sometimes where they live, it's very hard to charge, even if infrastructure is added there. You know, it's, it's you know, somebody gets home from work at night, they, it is hard to take their car somewhere in that town, even if it's there. But if it's areas where they work, there's a long period of time where that car can charge. So just something to think about that all of the um, charging infrastructure and things doesn't go just in certain areas, but it's like an end-to-end -end thing so that it actually really works for every, for those people particularly. Like I'll just give you my my examples in Coronado. I don't need any more chargers. I have one in my house. So, but the people that work there, they don't have any chargers. So they drive in from El Cajon to work and they don't, don't have very, I mean, we're adding some at the city level, but I think the incentivizing localities to do that is a big deal because most local councils are thinking, you know, often about their residents and, and their voters, but, you know, our, our, like Coronado, for instance, is probably less than 80% of the people, I mean, less than 20% of the people in Coronado at any time are residents. So anyways, thank you. Any other member comments? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, we just comment that uh, we hear a lot about electric vehicles that we know is very battery intensive. And then we hear about electric bicycles, which is much less, but also more complicated to get around on. And I uh, just would also like to hear more mention of electric motorcycles, which is an emerging technology, because that's sort of a, I think, a happy medium that you can get on the freeway with, but is also much less energy intensive, you know, useful for one person to commute. So I just haven't seen much mention of it, and I just wanted to flag that. Seeing no other hands raised, I'll start with mine. Um, just as a side note, I, uh, we need to convert to electric vehicles as soon as we can, um, but uh, ultimately that's not enough. Uh, so I know, I just want to remind folks, carb scoping uh, uh, plan that came out just last year, we need to reduce VMT 25% by 2030. Uh, so that means three, four percent every year for every jurisdiction. And so that's to me is the target. And we can do that with a number of other means, carpooling and whatever we don't have to build if transit today or tomorrow, uh, we should be doing in the next 10 years. But even without that, we can make that target of reducing VMT. <laughs> but with regards to um, electrification uh, of our vehicles, I'm particularly interested in uh, the trucks um, and strategy number nine, uh, because there's a disproportionate amount of illness and harm being caused in our communities uh, due to diesel particulate matter and uh, 2.5. And that comes from large trucks and medium-sized trucks. Uh, so when we talk about the co-benefits of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, uh, to me, this is very important. Uh, people are being hurt now disproportionately, and when we address equity issues, this should be our target. It was pointed out during our last workshop with regards to uh, maybe we're concentrating on that. That's one of our priorities in our next RTP. But for this discussion, um, I want to see if we can develop some strategies so that we work with the Portside Community Plan to reduce uh, th that target and their aspirational goal of reducing uh, or actually converting all trucks to non-polluting trucks in those particular uh, communities by 2030. 
32. So eight years, Susan, your challenge is to get all those trucks that go to the Portside communities to be all EV. Uh, to me, that's the, that's, that's the priority. Uh, and there's a way, number of ways to do that. So besides charging stations, I hope we could also incentivize fleets to convert by paying for the upfront cost. Um, and, and maybe we can pay the interest rate. Maybe we can give them a down payment and, and then they could pay back later because EVs ultimately, uh, and EV trucks ultimately, um, there's a cost savings, right? But because the initial investment is high, uh, fleets are not converting right away to upfront costs. So if we can help in that, I don't know, even with a loan, maybe Santa can even make money 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. So because the, it's a it's a win win, you know the company saves money because they don't have to maintain their trucks as much or have that much of a cost, and ultimately it's an investment. That's why people will lease um, your roof space for solar panels, be because they save me money by not paying SDG as much money for energy or or community power, as well as um, the company that loaned me that. Uh, um, uh, EV panel, right? leasing that uh, uh, solar panel uh, also makes money. I think the same is true for particularly large fleet trucks, which um, in which the upfront cost is very high. So to me, that's a strategy that we can maybe think about in strategy number nine and concentrate it on the, the areas in our community, in our in our, um, our region, which includes San Marcos, includes uh, uh, Coronado, includes La Mesa as well as the poor side communities um, that suffer so much from the pollution. So we get in, we also target the, the co-benefits of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Anyway, that's my long little comment or <laughs> ideas. But in any case, uh, I really like, uh, of course, this program. I think it's important, but I think uh, the, part, the prioritization is important as well as uh, really making some concrete steps uh, on these strategies and coming up with uh, things that are workable. Um, that may have some high ups, uh, upfront costs, but I think ultimately we're going to have a savings. If not in transportation, we're going to have a huge savings in these particular communities in terms of health impacts. The, the doctor's bill needs to be part of our calculation. The emergency room should be part of our calculation when we talk about the cost benefits of uh, EV conversion. So anyway, uh, any other last comments for anyone? If if not, we can close. Uh, thank you very much, Susan, for the great, important uh, uh, presentation and, and my little rant. Um, let's see. We have any public, any, any, I think there was a call for any uh, last couple of comments, if not, uh, if not. Any last uh, questions or comments from members? And in topic, if not, with that, our next uh, transportation committee meeting is scheduled for Friday, September 1st at 9 a.m. Um, and uh, also a reminder that our meetings in August are uh, canceled. And with that, we are adjourned. Hey, a minute before 12.